The proceeding will start shortly. 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 The 
The proceeding will start shortly. 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 Good morning. If I call the meeting of the committee to order and welcome the witnesses uh, for this evidence session of the Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee as part of our inquiry into reality television. Uh, before we start the, the questions and the evidence session, I would just like to remind members that in accordance with the House's sub judice resolution, reference should not be made to matters before coroner's court and therefore the inquest into the death of Stephen, Stephen Diamond should not be referred to. However, discussion of, of the wider issues relating to the Jeremy Carl show uh, and other shows is permissible, just to state that for the record. Um, we'd like to start um, our questions relating specifically to the Jeremy Kyle show uh, with reference to the use of the lie detector test, which I think has been a key feature in the programme. And for the benefit of the record and for people watching, we're just going to play a very short clip of the use of the lie detector test and Jeremy Kyle delivering the results of that. And then we will ask some questions about the test itself. So if we could play the clip, thank you. Let's do what we came to do, those all important live detector results. Will, thank you very much indeed as ever. We will ask, in this case, my friends, one question. Central to the Jeremy Carl show was the use of lie detector tests. Amanda and Peter agreed they both wanted the lie detector test from November 2015. Jeremy Carl presents their results almost as facts. We asked Amanda, since November 2015, when you moved house, have you passionately kissed anyone other than Peter? You said no. Why did you say no? It's the truth. The test is you're a liar. <gasps> you had sexual contact with anyone other than Peter? You said no. This test says you lied on that question. Oh, that's, I did not. that's why you didn't want to come on stage, eh? No, I haven't done anything wrong. Come on. Thank you. Um, Tom McClellan, you're executive producer of the, the, the programme. How long has, has the polygraph test lie de, or lie detector test, how long has that been a feature of the Jeremy Cole show? So the show um, has been on air for nearly 14 years. Uh, we've recorded over 3,000 episodes uh, and the lie detector has been a part of talk shows in Britain probably for over 20 years and, and on talk shows all around the world, but since the beginning of Jeremy Carl. Since the beginning of the show? Yes. How accurate do you think the polygraph test is? So we, we've always made it very, very clear to the viewers and to the participants of the show that the uh, lie detector is not 100% accurate. Um, we've always felt that that's incredibly important. Um, so before the guests even um, come to the studios for recording, we'll make that point. Um, we tell them before they, they take the lie detector and obviously afterwards. And um, as you'll see on that clip, um, as Jeremy is... Uh, well, would, we also put it on screen, uh, but the lie detector is designed to indicate whether somebody is being deceptive, but uh, practice claim, uh, practitioners claim it to have a high level of accuracy, although this is disputed. So we always want it to be extremely clear, not only with the people on the show, but also the viewers. Yeah, so uh, you're quite right. In the, con in the contract, the, the participants of the show sign, it says it's not guaranteed to be 100% accurate, and the company that does the test says that on its website too. But how accurate do you think those tests are? I understand you think they're not 99% accurate, but what level of accuracy do you, do you believe those tests have? 
I, I, we know they aren't 100%, and so that's why we've always been incredibly clear with the people coming on the show before they, they you know, were filmed and before they took the test and to the viewers. So um, I'm sure you're aware that the, the Dispatches did a programme about Jeremy Carr's show uh, in that Professor Ray Bull of Derby University said he believed in even in sort of perfect conditions with a trained expert using the machine that the, the test was at best a 66 to 70 percent chance of an accurate score. I think if you if you ask different experts you'd get different opinions mm -hmm. so that's why we were always very clear to make sure that everybody was aware that it wasn't 100 percent um, and that's why we came up with that disclaimer. Yeah, but the disclaimer doesn't really mean very much, does it? Because not 100% might mean nearly 100%, but we might be, there might be some minor uh, discrepancy. Um, Professor Bull's uh, estimate is that two times out of three, the test is accurate, but one times out of three, it's wrong. And that's quite a big difference, isn't it? Well, we, like I say, if you ask different people and different, uh, you know, I, I've worked in, in other countries on, on lie detectors, and if you ask different people, get different opinions. So we felt it was incredibly important, and I can't stress this enough, to make sure that every single person who had a lie detector was fully informed that it was not 100% accurate. Yeah, but, but, but not 100% and maybe only two-thirds right is a massive difference. It's I a think, massive difference uh, in the way that's perceived. And, and as you've seen, the, and the reason we wanted to play the clip, Jeremy Cole's choosing his words carefully. He's not saying you're a liar, he's saying the test says you're a liar. But nevertheless, it's not the test says you might be a liar, or the test said you might not be right. It's being presented black and white, you lied. And that is, being, and that is causing, obviously, considerable distress to the people receiving the results. I think we've got to remember that, you know, the, the people that appeared on the show, you know, were the viewers. Um, and they used to, you know, were a good proportion of the viewers, and they would watch the show on a daily basis. Um, and when we were going through all our procedures, if we ever, we would ask them, you know, have you ever seen the show? Um, and they would always come back and say that they had seen the show and they'd watch it as a re on a regular basis. If they you know, hadn't seen the show, that would be a, a, a huge flag for us. So they had watched the show, they had applied to be on the show, they had also um, you know, wanted to take a lie detector, they had, seen, they had seen the show, obviously they knew of Jeremy's presenting style, they knew the accuracy because we'd made it very clear, so they were co completely fully informed uh, by the time that they were appearing on the show. Um, have, you, have you ever, uh, the company that does the tests, have you asked them what they believe the accuracy, accuracy rate is? Well, uh, yeah, we've, we've talked to them, uh, you know, uh, over a long period of time and, and, and they told us that it is not 100%, yeah, so but, that's so why we've made it very so clear. You're the executive producer, you're responsible for this programme. Yeah. So have you inquired as to how effective these tests are, what the percentage likely success rate is? Yeah, which is not 100%. Not, uh, beyond that, have you said, have you said, okay, not 100%, so what is the actual percentage? Because I've got to be responsible for this program. Well, no, as, as I said to you, if you ask different examiners, you'd get different opinions. So what's the range you've been so, 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 so uh, you know, because we would get different opinions, you know, we felt it was incredibly important to make sure that everybody was informed that the test was okay, not 100%. Okay, what's the range? What's the range then? If, you've, if you said we've had different opinions, so what's the range of opinion? Um, I mean, we could, we, could, we could talk to five different examiners and get a range of opinions and send them on to you. Well, so, well, have you got those figures? Have I haven't got those figures. Do you not know? Right do, do you not know, actually? Do you I know that, that it's an 100% show and we made it very yeah, clear you not, to everyone, not know including what, the viewers. I think it's a pretty fundamental program. Do you not know what the, uh, what the range is? Can you, you don't have that information in your head? I, I don't have the information in front of me now. I find that astonishing, actually, because this is, you know, you know, become one of the most criticised elements of the show, one of the most controversial, one of the things that causes the most amount of stress. It's presented as fact. The, it is disputed how good, the, how good the technology is, but you don't know yourself what the range is in terms of the likely, likeliness to get a true and accurate reading out of the test. I think we knew it wasn't 100%. We, we put on screen to the viewers, we would tell the, the contributors that the lie detector is designed to indicate whether somebody is being deceptive. Practitioners claim it to have a high level of accuracy, although this is disputed. Yeah, but, you can't, but you can't define what high level of accuracy is. I am other than not, not, not 100%, but 50% is not 100%. I am not a lie detector expert, so what we would do is... No, but you're respons you, are, you are responsible for this programme. You are the person who's responsible for this program. This is a key feature in this program. And I think if you were using that and if you were being responsible, you would know the answer to that question. Like I said, I'm not a lie detector expert, so, so we would hire in a lie detector expert. They would do the tests, uh, they would come up with the results, and then the results would be given to the producers, which would then be given to Jeremy. 
Um, we wouldn't get involved with the actual lie detector okay, test. Okay, well, you, you commissioned this. I think, uh, and I think if you don't know the answer to that question, you can't say what the range is of the likely accuracy of those tests. I think, I, I think, I think that is irresponsible. I think it's disputed, so it's very difficult to come I, up with I, that I'm, figure. I understand it might be disputed, but I've asked you yeah. what, the, what the range was, not, not necessarily to pin yourself on a particular number, but to give an idea of the range. I, I'm disappointed that you can't do that. Where are the tests done? So they would be done in, in uh, rooms in uh, Media City, uh, and like I say, it would be done away from the production by uh, an expert. And, and, and when were they, in terms of, uh, what's the time difference between the test being done and the results being uh, given to the person who's done the test as they were, as they were done in that clip? So um, normally the test would be done probably the day before. Sometimes it would be done the day of record. Okay. So would it be useful if I explained the production process of how... The show was recorded um, on a... Well, we're sure we'll come on to that as we go okay. through, but at the moment I just want to just yeah. focus on this bit. We've got a okay. range of topics we want to discuss. Yeah. So, what, I mean, what, I mean, it's, it's not secret information. You read up on the way polygraph tests are done. Obviously, a machine can't tell whether someone's lying. It's reading bodily functions. It's reading heart rate. It's reading perspiration rates. So, how li likely do you think it's, it, that, that, te that test is going to be accurate when this has not been done in a controlled environment, but someone who's away from their home, staying in a hotel at Media City, maybe on the day they're going to make a television programme where they're probably quite nervous and quite anxious about that. How likely is it, do you think, that they're going to give a calm, measured reading in that test? I think, you know, we, we've got experts to take the test, um, and I think that the, the contributors were fully informed beforehand of, of what the test involved, um, and they had they, they, they would have asked us to appear on the show and to take a lie detector test. They may have been informed. They were told by you that this is an expert who can do the test, uh, and it's it's got a it's not one hundred percent accurate, but but experts say it's accurate. They don't know how accurate it is. Uh, they're not doing it in controlled conditions. They're doing it in a, in a makeshift facility on the day potentially they're going on a television program when they might be feeling quite anxious. And the people who are doing the test, what uh, do they are they people that just work for the company that. Um, that, that own the equipment? Yeah, we, 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 we um, employed uh, professionals to take the test. And so, so obviously they work for a company, I know it's a company that, yeah. uh, that um, I think it's called UK Lie Detectors or something like that. Com company. Yeah. Uh, and they're based in Manchester as well, aren't they, I think? Um, I think their offices potentially might be in Norwich actually, oh, okay. but I'd, I'd need to check that. Okay. But it's not, the test's not being done in like, a controlled medical facility or a research laboratory or, or it's being done at Media City. And the people doing it, they have medical qualifications for doing the testing? I don't think they've got medical qualifications, but they've got qualifications in, in, in lie detector. Is there, is, there a, is, there a, is there a body, is there an organisation that issues the qualifications in being a lie detector tester? That was, um, there, there are, um, and I can get those details and, and give them to you. But those are likely to be the qualifications, if they have any at all, that these people have? Yeah, and uh, the, the people that we used, you know, had been doing this for many, many years, you know, and, and were... Um, you know, comp obviously very competent. It seems a very precarious environment for people who are potentially going through what could be a life-changing moment, you know, um, and, and I'm not sure that, that the show is preparing people for what this means, or indeed even briefing them properly as to how, you know, potentially likely this test is to be very flawed. It's not been done in a controlled way, not by people with medical qualifications, not been done in a specialist facility, and people aren't being told what the range of percentage is in terms of how likely this is to be true or not. And that seems to be quite a precarious position to put people in. Uh, Mr Stanier, from your position as Director of Aftercare, I mean, from the, for, for people that you've met who've been on the show, who've had concerns or anxiety after the show, how much has that been linked to people that have been through lie detector tests who may have been adversely affected we, by that? We explain it differently. Uh, what we would say is that uh, prior to the show is that some people will fail this test but yet they will be telling the truth. So we, we, we explain it diff differently. We don't use percentages. We just make it very, very clear that some people will fail that test, but yet they'll be telling the truth. So I think that's a fairer way to explain it. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's very fair because I don't think people have been given the full mm. picture of what these mm. tests are, how inaccurate they could be. Uh, they're not being told that information. But the question I asked you was about, in terms of aftercare, after show, do you think actually the polygraph test is a contributing factor to people that suffer with you know, concerns, depression, after they've been on the show? I think, yes, when somebody yes, says... Yes, it is. You think it is? They, they do become distressed yeah. uh, because uh, they disagree with the result. And therefore, that's why we have, um, I guess, welfare service after show uh, in order to uh, alleviate that distress. And 
what, you, what we want is for people to be um, comforted, controlled, calm uh, after that result. Yeah. Um, so when, in that aftercare process, do you say to them, look, don't worry, you know, the test is probably only two-thirds of the time accurate, so chances are it might not be true. Do you say that to them? We do, because we've actually mentioned it prior to the show, yeah. so, we, so, will, so we will reiterate that point, that uh, we'll go back to the point that we raised before the show, which is that some people will fail this test, yet they will be telling the truth. Yeah, but if they've also been told before the show it's not 100% accurate, but being led to believe it is highly accurate... The aftercare, if you've got someone who's distressed or you've got a couple, maybe very distressed, maybe about to make a life changing decision based on the results of this test. Yes. Do you sit them down and say, look, you know, um, actually the, the accuracy of this is greatly disputed. You know, it might be a third of the time it's not accurate at best. And therefore, you know, you shouldn't rely on this test. Do you sit people down and have those sorts of conversations as specifically as that? Again, we, we won't, I won't refer to specific numbers because I'm naive about the, the figures well, do you, of accuracy. Say, but are you aware of figures, though, of accuracy? I've always been aware that the lie detector was not 100% yeah, accurate. Yeah, I know that. But you said, you said, I'm aware of the figures. So you're aware of a range. Um, I, no, I'm not. You're I'm not. not. So you're the director of aftercare on this programme and you don't have any figures for the percentage of accuracy of this I, test. I would prefer to say to them that some people will fail this test, yet they will be telling the truth before they do the test. And then after the test, I will raise that again. But doesn't that mean, it's just meaningless, isn't it? I mean, it's a meaningless piece of information to, to give to people. I, I, and from me, my point of view, it's about keeping them informed. But they're not, you're not, are you? Because you're, you're not giving them information that could be relevant, would help them to put the test into context. I'm, I'm informing them that, that um, some people can um, fail the test, but yet be telling the truth. And then I can raise that if people are upset after the show. I can raise that again and say, this is what we spoke about. Yeah, but in the, con in the context of so before the show, people are being told it's not 100% accurate, but the people who do the test believe it is highly accurate, so they believe it is highly accurate. And it's being presented on the show as definitive by Jeremy Carr. There's no ambiguity I, in what I he's do saying there. And then yeah. afterwards, you're not saying, saying to people, well, OK, there is a range of scores here. The test isn't, you know, sh you shouldn't rely on it. You don't even know what the range of accuracy is uh, yourself. You've just said that. I, I, I prefer to say to them that some people will uh, fail the test. Joe Stevens. Um, can I go back to you, Mr McLennan? You said that you, there are different views from different experts about the reliability of the lie detector test. Can I just clarify, have you actually got information about that? Have you commissioned it? Did you look at it? Or are you talking about doing that in the future when you gave your answers previously? Um, like I said, what, what we know is that the test is... No, can you answer the question, please? Have you, as a programme, as the executive producer, yeah. actually sought out those different views that you discussed of experts about the reliability of the test, or... Is that something that you intend to do in the future? I want to know whether you've already got the information and you've looked at it or whether you yeah. haven't got the information at all. So, so I've, I've been around lie detectors in, in my professional career for the last um, 15 to 20 years. Um, so, um, so, so I know that there is different opinion. I, um, so so, so, that, that's so I'll I ask you the same earlier. question that the chair asked uh, Mr Stanier. So this is why it was very... What's the range? Yeah, well, well this, is, range? this is why... This is why you know we wanted to make it clear to, to, to the con contributors and to the public that it was you know designed to um, you know and practitioners claim it to have a high level of accuracy or those it's disputed. We, we we felt it was incredibly important to get that point across to the contributors. Right. So, so you they, can't they, tell they us they what the range is because you don't plus, know what plus, the range plus is. Plus the viewer. Yeah. So you don't know what the range is. Well, we know it is dis disputed. You don't know so what the range is, do you, Mr. McLennan? We know it's Otherwise, you tell me. <laughs> yeah. OK, so if you were going into hospital to have an operation and the doctor said to you, this operation's not going to be 100% successful, would you just sit there or would you say, well, what are the likelihoods of it being successful? Well, I, I think what we did is we, we, we gave the information to the contributor and they, they decided, you know, they, like I said earlier, they, they, they applied, for, they watched the show, they'd applied they, and they gave informed consent to come on the show and also they wanted to take a lie detector. How can they give informed consent if you don't tell them what the accuracy of the test is? You can't, you know, you can't just say it's, it's not 100% accurate because that could mean it's 1% accurate or 99% accurate. How can, that, how can they give informed consent in I those circumstances? If, we, if we'd given a percentage, that could have been you know, more dangerous because I think if we'd spoke to different people, we would have got different percentages. So we felt it was very uh, responsible to 
to, to give this, which is that it's not 100% because we wanted the people to be informed before they took a lie detector, before they went on the show. So why is the premise of the entire show based on an exercise that is obviously flawed, that's inaccurate? Yeah. I mean, it's, the premise of the show is fake, isn't it? No, I think one thing I'd like to say is that the show actually dealt with lots of different issues and sometimes we'd do you know, um, shows about you know, inspirational children and different things. Um, and, you know, yes, we used to use the lie detector. I think when you go onto kind of YouTube and you, you see the show, you'll see the most conflict moments of the show. People who watched the show, you know, which was a huge amount of people, I think one year 55% of the country watched an episode of Joe and Carl. You know, the people who watched the show, you know, would, would, would see a different thing. They saw a show that was, was conflict but was also resolution. But they'll see lie detectors being used. So can you answer my question? But that's why why we use do the you lie use something that is so flawed... Yeah. As, a sen as a premise, okay, maybe you might not agree with me that it's the central premise of the show, but it's a significant part of the show. Why do you use something that's so flawed? And why do you not tell people yeah. how flawed it is in I think, specific terms? Like I said, we, we use different tools. So the lie detector is one tool, you know, to try to get to resolution. We use DNA testing. We'd also put people in, in uh, rehab, um, you know, in-house rehab units, you know, to try to help them with drug and alcohol abuse. So there was, there was a range of different things that we would use, and lie detector was one of them. But I think the most important thing was that, you know, we, 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 we felt that our duty of care was really important and that we needed to make it very clear to the contributors and to the viewers that the tests weren't 100% uh, accurate. You have a very, very unusual view of the concept of duty of care, Mr Clement. Yeah, I, mean, I, do, I appreciate there are other aspects of the show, but I think we all know if it wasn't for the lie detector test, we might not be sitting here today. Clive Effort. Yeah, yeah, just very briefly, Chair. Just, just uh, in, in the light of your answers regarding um, the uh, accuracy of a lie detector and the fact that you accept that um, it, there is a significant amount of disagreement about the accuracy, a clip we just saw, the way that the, the results were presented to that uh, participant, do you still consider that to be appropriate? I think, um, obviously, we did not pick that clip, that, um, but uh, watching that clip now... Well, you do you dispute it, it, that, that, just, that, that it exists? Saying, you don't, don't, don't know, it's broadcast, yeah. yes? You yeah, accept so that? We, we watched the... Um, just watching the clip there, I think um, Jeremy, you know, did have a strong opinion about the lie detector, um, and um, so we, so that's why we also felt it was so important to make it very clear that it wasn't 100% accurate, and that's why we put it on screen as he was giving the results. And so, what did you take from the, the from him implying that, that you know he waved the card, and that, that this is the reason why you wouldn't go on the stage? What, did, what, did, what was he indicating there? Do you think? Well, I think you know, like I said, Jeremy's got a very strong views, so he obviously believed in the result there, and he was. Um, he was saying that to the contrib contributor, um, so that's why we needed to make it very clear. And you, and you said that you, in, you, you've been uh, uh, in association with programmes that have used lie detectors over 15 years or so in, in a previous answer. Other than in reality TV shows, where, where, where have you used lie detectors? Uh, only within television. So, so ITV wouldn't use lie detectors on their own employees, for instance? Um, I don't think I don't believe that is, that has happened, um, and I think they wouldn't think that appropriate. Pardon, sorry. You don't think that they would think that appropriate. Um, well, I just but I, it's okay for I don't reality believe, TV. I don't believe that has happened, but I think every single contributor on any show that has had a lie detector, you know, um, you know, is 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 full, been fully informed and um, has also, um, you know, agreed to take part. Okay, Mr. Mr. Stanley, in an earlier answer, you you you, you use the term. Uh, it, and you did it twice, actually, uh, that, that if a, a participant disagrees with the result. Is that a pejorative term? No, it, it, it will happen uh, in terms of um, the result comes out and they say that uh, they disagree with it. In terms of they fail the result, they fail and they'll say, no, I was telling the truth. But are you, uh, are you not indicating there that... You, you believe in the accuracy of the, you accept the accuracy of the lie detector, and therefore the I, people are disagreeing, but they're not right in disagreeing. I accept that um, some, and, and this is definite that the language that I use with guests, that some people will fail that test yet be telling the truth. And I totally accept that I don't know the percentage of success or the percentage of failure. 
Um, I'd rather work with guests in that way. Okay. Okay, leave it then. Um, just, I just wanted to, Mr. McLaren, something you said. Um, I think you said Jeremy Carl felt strongly about the test. Is that, that correct? Uh, yeah, to, to my understanding, he be, you know strongly believed in the test. Yes. So he he believes 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 in the test themselves. Does he and does he believe the test is an important part of the of the show? Yeah, I, I obviously can't talk for Jeremy no. today, but my understanding is that he did believe in the test. So, but um, I think it's just interesting because um, you know, we it's been suggested to us that Jeremy Carter is the presenter of the program and doesn't really have much of a say in the format of the program. But I think. You know, but clearly you believe that he thinks this is an important part of the format of the show. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's one of the, yes. the tools yes. that we used, and, and I, I believe that Jeremy believed in the test. Um, yeah. Okay. Charles Watman. Yes, um, I'd just like to... The overriding impression uh, given by the show that is that the lie detector is definitive. That's the impression that's given. I mean, otherwise you kind of wouldn't have a show. We're talking showbiz here. And it has been described, the show, uh, the Joe McCall show, as, as a sort of form of bear baiting. And uh, w one of the questions that uh, comes to mind, well, first, first of all, I'd like to ask you, has there ever been a case where somebody has failed the lie, lie detector and has subsequently proved that the lie detector test was wrong? And if that has happened, has it been publicised and have you, as newspapers do, printed a retraction? Um, I, can't, I cannot recall a case. Um, right now of that happening, but I can look into that and write to you after this. All right. Because okay. I don't, you know, I want to make sure that I'm giving you the correct information. It would be interesting to find out. Um, yeah. uh, but then that, that brings me on to the guest's understanding of what they're getting into. Yes. Um, and, and it occurs to me, I'm, I have a, a career in intro business. I understand yeah. how it works. And, and as an actor, I had a, a, a union behind me, equity, and I had a, an agent, and they had entertainment lawyers. So I had the backup. You're picking on uh, members of the general public who don't have that sort of backup. They are not professionals in their arena. And you've got people who's, for, for many reasons, whose understanding of what they're getting into might not be as deep as perhaps mine might be. Uh, and you are then, to a certain extent, <coughs> would it be fair to say, exploiting that because you are then presenting them with someone who has the razor-sharp mind of a barrister and can tear them apart in public, which is part of the entertainment in, in, in the sort of Roman Colosseum-like way. Would you say that's a fair assessment? I, I wouldn't. I, I, I don't believe the people that came on the Jeremy Carr show was, were exploited. Um, I think, you know, to talk about the process, I think, you know, we, 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 we did take our duty of care incredibly seriously. And I think that what we would do, you know, is 99% of the people that apply to come on the show applied because they were watching the show on a daily basis. Um, they wanted, they had a problem, and they wanted to come on the show. Um, they would apply directly to the show. Um, they love Jeremy, and they wanted to hear his advice. You know, I know some people, you know, will watch the show and see clips and think, you know, will find that hard to believe. But the truth is that the people who were watching the show, you know watched on a daily basis and they wanted to come on the show and they wanted to hear Jeremy's advice. Well, um, interesting so then we went... Go it's an interesting uh, thing you said there, was it that they have a problem. Are you not in some way exploiting the fact that they have a problem? Well, I think just, you know, just because somebody's got a problem doesn't mean that they're being exploited. You know, I think uh, the fact that they want to come on this forum and, you know, talk about their problem and the show was, yes, it was conflict, but it very much was resolution as well. We were always striving for resolution. And we did have proper systems in place that beforehand, you know, 90% of the people that applied on the Jeremy Carr show did not get on the show. Um, and it was because we would go through lots of different checklists with them, and if any flags came up, we would pass them to the aftercare team, which really was more of a guest welfare team, um, and they would be spoken to. And if you know, if there was any point in the process that they, um, you know, felt that they shouldn't be appeared on the show, the producers didn't override the aftercare team. They would absolutely be listened to. If Graham said that person cannot come on the show, then that person would not be on the show. And then the, the aftercare would carry on throughout. It's interesting, the clip that you showed earlier, I could actually notice there was two mental health nurses in that room, you know, while that was going on. Um, and then afterwards, we would then, there would be... Um, there would be aftercare afterwards, you know, and there would be, um, you know, counselling put in place, and we would keep in contact with them. So, but the, say the, I, the guests who come on your show are in a bad place to start with. 
Well, no, they and would have would a problem. Be, they would have a problem. That, yeah. that, that, we're going to come on to talk a bit more about the aftercare and the, and the guest selection, because we might do that at that moment, if that's OK. Thank you. Ian yeah. Lucas. Can I just clarify, first of all, that the show is a, an ITV production, and you, you are the person in charge of the production. Is that right? Yeah, so I'm, sorry if I didn't make that clear, um, so I'm a Director of Entertainment North, so I am in charge of, of many different programmes across lots of different genres, including you know, factual and current affairs and different things, um, and also we have a daytime output, um, and I was one of the executive producers of the Jeremy Clark show. So the researchers who are speaking to uh, contributors to the show, are they employed by ITV? The researchers, yeah, yes. So each team, um, so we uh, we would make uh, normally three, potentially sometimes even four shows in a day. We'd normally record on a Thursday and Friday. Uh, the team would normally have three days of casting, where they would go through all the telephone numbers and all the people that had contacted the show. Um, they would then talk to them, and they'd also talk to you know the other side of the person that they had a problem with. If both sides agreed, they would then go to senior management. Um, discuss the story with them and then they'd start going through the checklist and, and getting the aftercare team involved when appropriate. So how many re of these researchers are there? So there'd be s six teams and each team would have a producer, an associate producer, a senior producer, sorry, a senior researcher and a junior researcher. Um, and then we'd have teams so around them for travel and everything else. So, so does that mean three people in the team or, or they have people so as, as well? So four, four people in each team, and each team would be, um, be, would be making one show per week. Okay, so how do you find contributors to the show? So 99% of all contributors would call, so there'd be an advert in, within the show, which saying if, if you have a problem or if you would like a lie detector, you can, you can contact the show. So 99% of people would contact the show. Occasionally there'd be maybe social media adverts or that kind of thing, but we didn't kind of street cast or anything like that. With people would apply to us, and like I said, if, if somebody wasn't a regular viewer of the show, then that would be a, you know, a huge flag for us. So you placed social media adverts, for example, on <coughs> Facebook. Um, I believe that yeah, at time to time that would happen, but normally it would be, um, it would be through the show. So in one of the checklists, which is from the show, you ask a spef specific question. Did you get in touch with the show after you saw an advertisement on Facebook? So, so why did you ask that specific question? I think if above that, the, the question above that is actually: Have you um, have you um, have you are you a regular viewer of the TV show? Uh, and then we come to that question, which is um, just so we're fully informed. So we're fully informed where that person came from because we. If, if they didn't come through the normal way, which is 99% of people through contacting through the show, we'd, we'd want to know the fact that it was through social media. So why did you say Facebook? Why did you say on social media? I think, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I think it's because, because Facebook was... Um, is it because you advertise on Facebook? Well, no, I said, I said that I think there has been adverts on Facebook, yeah. Mm. But, but you specifically ask about Facebook specifically. So, do you t do you advertise on other social media platforms? Um, I'm not aware, but I can. I, I would need to find that out, information out. <laughs> so, do you know what sites you advertise on Facebook on? Is on, on the uh, when you go with, sure when you're advertising on Facebook, yeah. how do you who, how do you decide where the adverts are going? <coughs> well, like I said, I. Did, to my knowledge, ninety-nine percent of the people are coming through the television <coughs> show on a, on a trail. Aren't you targeting? Sure. You're targeting people on Facebook, aren't you? Yeah, but I, 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 like I say, not I, is that yes? Not many people come on the show through Facebook. Well, why are you asking specifically about Facebook in your questionnaire? Because I think if we we would want to know if they didn't come through the normal route, which is an advert on the on the uh, on the show. Can I suggest that you're targeting individuals on Facebook? Isn't that the truth? of the matter. No, the, like I said, 99% of people who came on the show would apply through the show. Um, we'd ask them if they were regu regular viewers, so we knew that they were uh, informed with the um, presenting style um, and also the content of the show. Were you trawling for contestants on Facebook? 
like, like I said, that I, I believe there were adverts that would go up on Facebook, but 99% of the guests would come through the show. So did you have a shortage of, I mean, did you have a shortage of applicants to go? You said 90% of people don't, don't get on the show. You said yeah, we believe day. around 1,000 people would, be appro you know, would, would, would apply to be on the show a week, and then 90% of those would not appear on the show. Okay. So why are you we advertising? on Facebook? Well because uh, if, if that was happened, because obviously it's a show, um, like any other daytime show, that's trying to get a range of, range of stories and topics. So are you micro-targeting advertising? I, I don't believe Facebook? we were, because I think the, the, the advert that we were are putting you on... Pe for people with particular issues and particular problems? Well we were looking for people who, would, who, who had a problem that they would want to resolve in, in that forum. So you were look, going out there and looking for people with problems? We, you were advertising for people with problems? I, I, I can only give you the same answer, which is 99% of the people who came on the show would be through the advert on the show. Do you think that's responsible? I to advertise for people with problems, to make the target? Well, we were, uh, we, we were advertising for people who had seen the show and would like to appear on the show. Okay, can I ask, I ask you about Mr. Kyle's involvement in the show yeah. and what his role is. Um, is he involved in scripting meetings on the show? Scripting meetings? No. So I could tell you uh, Jeremy's involvement. So he would, um, he would come, normally come up either the night before or the morning of, of record day. Uh, we would normally record on a Thursday and Friday. Um, so, and then he would come to a briefing on the Thursday morning. Um, we would go through all the notes of the guests that we had, had taken the night before. We'd go through a synopsis. Um, Graham would be in the room. Uh, we'd talk about if there was any concerns. Um, and, uh, but that would be the first time he would hear the stories that, he would, that would be on the show that day. So he, would he only meet the participants on the day of the show? Yes, he would, yes. Does he have preliminary meetings with, with them to discuss their particular problem? No, the, the, the producers would have those conversations and the aftercare, actually, which is really important actually, is uh, would, would do a face-to-face -face of the morning of, uh, and, and meet all the contributors before they went on the show. And even at that late stage, which did happen occasionally, if there was any concerns for, I guess, welfare, um, then, you know, uh, th th then we would not go ahead with that participant or story. So did Mr Kyle himself meet with the individuals before the show? Um, no, he didn't, no. Okay. In the notes that, that you send to, to uh, participants in the show, um, you're talking about the notes that, that, that are collected from the participants. You say, with these notes, Jeremy is better equipped to advise and offer as much help as he can to resolve whatever problem or issue you may be facing. So does Jeremy offer advice and help to contributors? So yeah, people would come on the show because they, they'd seen the show and the show was conflict resolution. In the, if it was conflict resolution show, you know, they were coming on and Jeremy would strive to find resolution for that story. And then after that, you know, after, you know, Graham was quite often on the show because we tried to make a big point that, that this was something that was very important to us on the show. But even after the cameras, obviously, you know, uh, and, and the show had finished, then Graham and his team would step in and also try to, to, to put together any aftercare yeah. that we felt was but important. But the, the notes don't say that, you see, they don't say our team yeah. is better equipped to advise and offer as much help <coughs> as he can. It says, Jeremy is better yeah. equipped to advise and offer as much help as he can. Right. So when does he give advice and uh, offer as much help as he can? At what point? So, so you know, viewers, is that during the show? Yeah, no, if viewers of the show, you know, who watched, you know, loyally every single day will absolutely know that yes, there was conflict, but there was also resolution. And that was so, important, so he would be striving yeah, for resolution. Okay. So, so the let, viewers, let me talk about the clip you yeah, you're course. on. Yeah. What offer and help did Jeremy offer in that case? So he was. What, what assistance and help did he offer? So, so um, we obviously didn't see the end of the, uh, end of the story, um, but he, he 
you know, any, any viewer, anybody who watches it knows that Jeremy is always striving for resolution at the end of the story, if it could be achieved. Sometimes it definitely couldn't be achieved, but the, the, the um, you know, he would always be trying to get resolution. Right. D does he offer any advice and help after the show? <coughs> is he involved in talking to people after the show? No, that would be more than Graham and his team. Uh, which is, you know, not just Graham, he's, he's got, uh, there's four on your team, isn't there? Uh, four people, and, and they would be involved in, in that afterwards. Right, so the only advice that he offers is during the show. That's correct, correct. yes. So, you know, I don't think the statement's true. I With think these notes, Je Jeremy's better equipped to advise and offer as much help as he can to resolve whatever, whatever problem or issue you may be facing. I, I, think, the, the, I think the viewer... Who, who then, you know, has watched Jeremy for years and years and years, you know, potentially thousands of episodes, they want to come on the show because they, you know, they respected Jeremy, they loved Jeremy, and they wanted to hear what his thoughts I've were on their it. problem. They, they probably so think I think Jer that was trying to reflect yeah, okay. that. Okay, but I think they think Jeremy's, you know, they, they have a positive impression of Jeremy, that's why they want to be on the show. Yeah, of course. But what, these, what the notes say to them, that you provide, is that... You know, he's going to offer uh, help and guidance to them. Whereas, in fact, what he's doing, he's putting them on the telly. He's, he's, not, he's not there to help them. He's there to entertain. I think... And, and you know, with respect to Mr. St uh, Stanier, his job is to clear up the mess afterwards. I, I, I don't see it as that. You know, of course we were... I'm sure you don't. You've been making the programme. But that's the reality. I mean, I think this is really misleading, what you send out to people. I think to viewers of the programme it wouldn't be. I, I honestly believe that people who watch the show <coughs> on a daily basis knew what Jeremy was. Yeah, of course, you know, some of the, what is Jeremy? Some of the things that we... What is Jeremy? How do you describe yeah, you, Jeremy? We'd see the kind of more conflict moments, but, but regular viewers would see that Jeremy, you know, is a fantastic presenter. Uh, they wanted him to... They wanted to come on the show. They wanted to talk to Jeremy. They wanted to hear his thoughts on their relationship problem or whatever the problem might be. And that's why they applied. And if I may just add, uh, if I may, um, just to echo Tom's <coughs> point here about it was at its heart a conflict resolution show and a relationship show, and people did proactively apply in the, in the, in the hope of fixing some uh, disputes, getting to the truth, uh, seeking help. And that I know firsthand, as the head of ITV Studios, how seriously duty of care was taken um, around informed consent, around being fit to participate, people being treated fairly. In this almost 15 year period, 20,000 people have um, uh, appeared as guests on this show. 3,000 episodes have been made, and in that entire time, there have only been five Ofcom complaints upheld against the show, three of which were about language, none of which relate to the actual duty of care or the unfair treatment or the uh, health and welfare of guests. In fact, of that 20,000 number, only seven guests in the entire history of complaints of Ofcom um, and none of those complaints have been upheld. And I think that that, that is a testament to the um, uh, seriousness um, um, of the duty of care, the way, the seriousness with duty of care. Have, was have you read these notes? From, have you read these notes that I read out? So are you addressing them to me? Yes, I am. I'm addressing to you, Mr. Mr. Bellamy. Uh, 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 I, I ha yes, I have read them. Right, yeah. so you, and I'm going to read them again. With these notes, Jeremy is better equipped to advise and offer as much help as he can to resolve whatever problem or issue you may be facing. Do you think that's a fair representation of what Jeremy does? I think it's an absolutely f fair representation of what happens in the show and that the people who applied to be on the Did show... Did you say the show? It says Jeremy. Well... And the, you're, it says Jeremy because you're trying to encourage people to come on the show because Jeremy's going to help them. Not the, not the team. Jeremy. Use the word Jeremy. People were very, very clear about the nature and content of the show. Well, I don't think this is clear. I think this is misleading for vulnerable people who you've targeted. That Do you know about the micro targeting? That does not capture, that is one document that is, does not capture the totality of the conversations that, that are had with the guests. So you think, you think it's accurate? That that's no, accurate. I'm saying you can't, just, you can't judge the programme on the basis of that one sentence. I'm saying that you have to look at the totality of it. And I would, again, argue that of 20,000 people that have appeared in this show, there's never been an off complaint upheld about unfair treatment of guests. 
Do you know about the advertising on Facebook? It's a relatively standard practice to um, um, uh, um, uh, advertise in that manner across social media for programmes. Can you tell us uh, which, where you targeted and what instructions you gave to Facebook or, or where they should place these adverts? N no, I can't, but I'm... I'm can, can you come back to us and tell us? Of course I can. Thank you very much. Thank you. Julie Elliott. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr Bellamy, you... That sentence that uh, Mr Lucas has read out, mm. would you say that is a, a true sentence or a false sentence? Sorry, which, sentence, truth, you which truth, sentence you're referring to? The sentence he's read out to you about Jeremy personally um, so helping people solve problems. Is that a true statement or is it a false statement? Well, I think if you watch the is show... Is it a true statement? Yes, in the show it is a true statement. You, but think, I'm that, you, you think that is a true statement? Well, if you watch the show, no, it's self-evident that that's what I simply want an answer. Does. You think that is a true statement or a false yes. statement? Thank you. And can I just ask you about lie detector tests mm. going back to... Is your, do you know what the percentage of accuracy is on lie detector tests? Because uh, you, were, you were the big boss of this organisation. Do you know? Uh, I, I know, um, echo what, what Tom said, which is that they weren't 100% accurate. Do you know what the range is? I don't. Thank you. Um, if we move on to um, some of the information that we've released at the start of um, the hearing today, um, which uh, your company provided us with, um, there's a lot of um, information about um, uh, whether uh, uh, there's assessments of whether any support may be required from our aftercare team. We've already heard in evidence this morning that the aftercare team is not really the right description of the no, team. I think, um, can, I, can I ask the question? What I'm concerned about is what, what pre going on the show care is given to individuals? Yeah, the aftercare party is about after the show, and the other, uh, they're all the same members of the team. Uh, guest welfare, they're, um, the, the production team will refer people where there are concerns. And then there will be. Um, so, is there any face-to-face sit-down meeting with the person? There is, but not at that point. The, at the point before they go on the show, is there any individual assessment of the person from yes. anyone who is medically qualified? They are um, specialist mental health nurse practitioners, and they will do face-to-face -face before okay. show. So, if we move to this Jeremy Kyle show checklist document that you provided us with, on page six. It says read out, and it says we require the following medical information due to the nature and subject matter of the programme. And in order to ensure that we meet our duty of care to you as a potential participant in the programme, including providing suitable access to filming venues. That's fine. There's then a series of boxes. Um, the series of boxes, the questions in the boxes, are they posed verbally or does the person read those? Is this on the guest welfare continuous assessment? This is on the document that I said it was called the Jeremy Kyle Show Checklist. That's a production, that's a production document. Right, so, so who, who goes through that with the individuals? So the uh, researcher or associate producer or, or producer would go through this and then as soon as there was any flags then it would be So nobody with the, any medical qualification would go through that? It would, it would, it would be gone through by production but then uh, so they don't, if anything... I presume they don't have medical sorry. qualifications. Uh, I, I think my reading of that list is it looks like it's a, like a call list that a casting researcher would go through on the phone. Or something. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, and that's why yeah. well, there's, there's scripting and everything to make sure that everyone's you know, yeah. saying the same so thing. So where, where I've read yeah. that bit out on page six... Sorry, we were struggling to find it. Page when, six of that yeah. document. OK, yeah. Halfway down, it says read out. Yes. And I've just read it out. We require the following medical information. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a series of boxes below. The yeah. boxes below, are they read out? Uh, yes. So the, the one I'm particularly concerned about is, do you have dyslexia or difficulty reading and writing? That's read out to the individuals, is it? It's, it's read out, yes. And the answers that come from that, if somebody says, no, I'm fine, or yes, I'm fine, is any further pursuant of that done with the individuals? So... Um ID paper. So, so th that was mainly that that the main flag for that would be um, because 
when we go through the consent forms and everything else, mm -hmm. then we'd, we'd be made aware of that so we could go through yeah. more, so, more fully with it. So, so they, what, they what I'm concerned about here is what consent. assessment are you, is your, whether it's researchers or anybody else, yeah. giving to the people who have applied to be on the show and have got to this stage yeah. about their understanding, their, la their level of language skills, their understanding of their literacy skills, their understanding of the comprehension of what having read some of these documents, are quite complex legalese yeah. documents yes. um, that I would suggest the average member of the public wouldn't necessarily have a huge comprehension of. Is there any assessment of that done at that point? So I think, you know, the... You know, it's, it's all part of a longer process, you know, because every single conversation we're having with them, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of building up to the informed consent. Um, and, and obviously, you're absolutely right, you know, with the dyslexia comment there. The reason for that is, is because then when we go through some of those forms, we know that we need to kind of go through them more verbally than maybe, you know, written. Um, but every, you know, it's, it's, this, this obviously gives a snapshot but, you know, uh, on the day, Graham and his team would also do a face-to-face -face assessment with every single person. Um, and about, if there was any about literacy skills and language skills and comprehension skills, is that done at any point? Well, um, I... Because somebody, yeah. um, if you look at all the evidence on people with, with not um, uh, a level of literacy yeah. and language skills that um, their age would say they should have, yeah. Um, somebody would, you know, if you look at any evidence on this, if somebody can read and write their, their name, their address, um, where they're from, etc., yeah. they would say they could read and write. Yeah. But could they read and write to the level that could understand the documents that you expect them to sign to give informed consent, going back to the point like, that my yeah. colleague Joan Stevens was making? So what assessment of language and literacy skills and comprehension no, skills is, do you make? This is something, you know, per, I personally have quite bad dyslexia, so I, I understand I'm, the importance I'm not actually, I'm putting dyslexia yeah. to one side. Oh, sorry, I, I, I am specifically asking yeah. about language skills, literacy yeah. skills and comprehension skills. Yeah. What assessment is your organisation at any level by anybody doing before yeah. someone is taken, given the documents to sign that you are saying gives yeah. informed consent? Well, like what I are said, you doing? It would that? be, you know, the conversations from the very first conversation till the moment that they, they appeared on the show would be lots of conversations. And obviously the checklist and forms would be gone through with them. Um, if there was a worry that somebody wasn't, um, you know, understanding properly, then obviously this is something that would be discussed, but it's very case by case. But so I, what, I do see your concerns. Con what would flag a concern to you? If, if, if somebody, you know, like I said, that was why it was very important to do a face-to-face face face before, um, you know, because with the best will of the word, you know, all the forms in the world, you know, might not pick, pick things up, you know, sometimes a face-to-face -face was the best thing. And that's why I was saying that even at that, that late stage, um, and we'd hope through all of our, our checklists and procedures, and actually, just to really make clear, the procedures, you know, constantly evolved. You know, this isn't just a, a procedures that we put in place 14 years ago and thought we'd done our job and let's carry on with them. I mean, on, on, on so can I sometimes just draw a monthly basis, we'd, we'd move... Can I draw you back to this yeah, no, question? Fine. I, just, I just think it's quite if, important to... If someone said yeah. the language... If somebody answered yes to that, that they're fine, would any further um, questioning or assessment be made of somebody's language literacy and comprehension skills? I think it would, it would have been, it would have happened throughout the process of How? conversations and, and on the one-to-one. -one. But it's something that, you know, obviously, you know, did, did concern me and it's something that we, you know, I, I feel uh, we took very seriously. But I How? can see where, where your concern is. But how you're not answering my question, not telling me in any way, shape, or form where you're assessing well, these just, skills. I'm trying to explain the the process. You know, so the process from the very first conversation. You know, we'd be uh, if any flags came up through the checklist. Um, you know, it would be passed on to the uh, duty care team, the aftercare team, who would talk to them about a range of different issues. But if somebody answered that question, do you have dyslexia, difficult reading and writing? If they said no, I'm yeah. fine. Would any further assessment be done of that person? Um, Straightforward question. Well, potentially not, but there would still be conversations going forward that we would hope, you know, would pick and up. And the conversations would specifically ask about language well, face, literacy? I'm not sure, I can't say it specifically would, but there would be conversations and a face to face with the team so before they went keep, on the show. You keep um, physically gesturing to Mr. Stanier. Mr. Stanier, what would follow if somebody think, said they could I think they had no issue? You know, you've highlighted something there. Um, I think 
that uh, because it does not say refer, then you have highlighted there that or identified that that needs to happen. They need to refer to um, aftercare, who then can do an evaluation on that. But if, if somebody answered that question that they can read and write and they haven't got dyslexia, that wouldn't come to you, would it? No. So there would be no further conversations, would there, Mr McLennan? Well, I, I, see what's, I, I would have hoped would it there, would have Mr. been picked McLennan? up in the one-to-one, -one, but I, I can see where you're coming from. So Would there be any further, further conversations? There would have been any official conversations, but there would have been a one-to-one So there would, be no, there would be no, at any point, if somebody answered that question to, that satisfied you, there would be no further assessment of that person that their understanding of quite complex contractual documents was at a level that really fulfilled your duty of care. That wouldn't happen, would there it? Would be, there would be no more official Thank you. conversation. Chair Stevens. Chair. Um, the checklist that Ms Elliott has referred to, obviously this is all self-disclosure. Yes. So you ask, you ask the contributors to the programme, they give you information. Um, it strikes me as a little bit odd when a lie detector test is a big part of the programme that um, you rely entirely on self-disclosure from contestants. Do you not think it's odd? <laughs> the premise of the programme is whether or not people tell the truth, isn't it? So, uh, and you're relying entirely on self-disclosure here. Well, it's, it, yeah. I mean, part of the process was obviously the, the, the checklist and the conversations and everything else. Part of the checklist was also talking to friends and family that were connected to the, the uh, contributor. Uh, and in those questions, we'd be trying to check to see if the information that they're giving to us is correct. So I could, uh, yeah, it was really self-disclosure, but we also talked to friends and family around them. Right. So, for and example, on other ITV programmes like Love Island, um, confirmation from a GP, for example, is asked for about a condition. Maybe you know, there's self-disclosure about a condition. Why don't you do that? So, um, I think Greg can probably talk talk more okay. about that as the head of aftercare. I think. Um, Self-disclosure, there's no reason to, for me anyway, to believe they're going to be dishonest. Uh, self-disclosure is, yes, you, they have to be honest in their self-disclosures. And I know this is a sad reflection because some people don't have GPs and some people don't attend GP practice. And whilst on the one hand it may come across as that we're improving a service, that, unfortunately, is a reality. Okay. So, of the contestants that appear on the show, do you know how many don't have GPs? Do you ever ask them if they've got a GP? Um, I work a, a lot in addiction, and a lot of the addicts that I speak to, uh, that I send to rehab, it's very difficult. Uh, so, in so a year, I probably, don't. I'm just looking at that group. Uh, that group is uh, probably the group that would inform me that they don't attend a GP practice. So you don't, you don't know how many people haven't got a GP? No. And we did have inside. a GP that we could... And I have, we do have a GP, but it's not their GP. Right. We do have a medical practitioner yeah. who we can contact and consult with. Okay. So one of the other documents that you very kindly disclosed to us is um, what's called a special category data notice for the Jeremy Kyle show. So this is quite a lengthy and detailed document that people have to sign and agree to, which enables you to keep and use very specific categories of data which would other, you'd otherwise not be allowed to use under uh, data protection legislation. Yeah. And that includes stuff about um, people's physical and mental health, their sex life, um, their race and ethnicity, uh, s stuff to do with the DNA testing and the lie detector testing. Um, I'm particularly interested that in this very lengthy and complex document, it says right at the end um, that if you don't sign the document, if you don't give us your consent so that you can have this data, and I'll come back to how, what you use it for and how long you keep it, um, then depending on the information concerned, we may not be able to proceed or continue with your application or participation in the programme. So effectively, people have no choice, do they? they are, if they want to come on the programme, they have to agree to you holding this very, very sensitive data and then doing with it what is set out in this document, otherwise they can't go on the programme. 
Yeah, obviously, you know, recently with the new GDPR regulations coming in, this is something that we've had to take very seriously and go through everything. Yeah, this but they is all can't, relatively. But, but you, yeah. you basically don't give them any choice, do you? Well, it's just, this is obviously all relatively new, and obviously we have a team of business affairs and, and lawyers that, um, you know, are, are trying to make sure that we're compliant, and that's what they're... Us. Okay, so it says also in this document that you will share um, internally with business affairs, as you mentioned, yeah. compliance and insurance teams. So I'm interested to know why would you share information about people's medical data with insurance teams? I'm um, I'm not sure of the answer. I'm, I'm not a, a lawyer, but I can get that information okay. and pass it. Because what concerns me is that if this information is being shared with insurance teams, it would yeah. probably affect the contributor's ability to get insurance in the future. Right, okay. So Let me look into I'd appreciate that. No, um, if you could write to the committee yeah, about that. Of Thank course. you. Um, how many contestants, in your experience, are put off? going on the programme after applying and getting through this process and uh, the self-disclosure form because of mental health issues, is that something that happens very often? I think, you know, it's, 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 it's a difficult thing because obviously we, we, we put in very, you know, um, you know, stiff duty of care um, because we wanted to make sure that everybody who appeared on the show, you know, was, was you know, uh, capable and, okay, you know, okay to appear. But obviously we also had to be very careful that we, we weren't... Um, you know, um, you know, not letting people with you know m mental health you know apply to be on the show because obviously you know sometimes there there is you know. So we going to back to my question, yeah. of the people that apply to be on the show, yeah, how many do you reject for concerns about mental health at that first point, and yeah. then people who actually you accept and then you go through this process with them, yeah, yeah. How many then, in your experience, have been rejected because of mental health issues? It's, it's going to be, it's, it, that's going to be very difficult to give. give well, is it lots of people? Is it very few people? Has it ever happened? I think referrals to uh, the assessing team, probably 50, 60 percent. So 50, 50 to 60 percent of people are then rejected? And not uh, uh, yes, at that yeah. point. Fine, okay. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to come back to something that you said, Mr Bellamy, about complaints to Ofcom. You said that there are only seven complaints made to Ofcom, I think. Um, By guests on the show, correct. By guests on the show, yeah. How many guests on the show make complaints to you as ITV after the show? I don't have that number to hand. But right. what Do you I, keep a record of what it? I, what I, I'd have to come back to you on that. I, 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 what I would say is if anyone raises an issue or a concern... Uh, or a complaint that isn't satisfactorily resolved, they are referred to Ofcom. So you tell them to go to Ofcom? Correct. Right, okay. So it would be very helpful for the committee to know, um, first of all, do you record complaints from guests, contributors to the programme, um, and how many complaints you get as a percentage of the guests that appear on the programme? If you could send us that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Brendan O'Hara. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Stanley, could I ask you, at the start of the session, we saw Jeremy Kyle thrust a card in front, in, 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 in the face of a crying woman, and declare, the lie detector says you're a liar. The director then cut to her husband, partner, whoever, who looked to be on the point of a breakdown. The director then cut back to Jeremy Kyle, who repeated the process, saying to this crying woman, the lie detector says you're a liar. In your professional opinion, is this acceptable behaviour? Are you comfortable with what you saw? It's not the behaviour I would uh, employ. Um, that's a really black and white uh, statement, you know, saying that somebody is a liar. Um, in, in terms of the two contributors, um, there were two members of Aftercare, and I think the example there was that uh, there was someone sat with uh, the female uh, on the sofa and they were, they were there because they didn't want to be on the centre stage. So they were taken into that room and then it was a very calm environment. And then as um, her partner comes in, there is another member of Aftercare coming behind him. Yeah, um, I, I, I saw all of that and I'll come back to the, 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 the people who were there in a moment, but I'm asking you, in your professional opinion, as the person employed to look after these very vulnerable people, are you comfortable with what you saw? 
That is um, the presenter's style, and I, I have. Yeah, I, I know it's his style, and I'm and aware of his style. But are you, as a professional, comfortable with what you saw? I'm responsible for me. I'm responsible for me and my behaviour. I can't be responsible for the presenter's behaviour. Well, well, what, 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 what is your what is your role then? If you're only responsible for yourself and you're not responsible for the presenter or the production. I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for me and I'm responsible for the guests and the presenter, uh, the responsibility for the presenter lies with production. Right, okay, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm very unclear as to what your role is then. I imagine that you would be an integral part of a, the production team, hired as a professional to say yes, no, you can do, no, you can't do, but that's clearly not your role. No, that is my role. That is my role. But then, in the in the, in the moment, uh, I think he becomes passionate. I think he becomes opinionated, and uh, he will deliver in that way. Um, and if people are uncomfortable with that, then I think that's a production issue to address that. Address no, well, that. well, well, okay. Well, let, let's talk about that specific incident we saw. What did you do in the immediate aftermath of that Both incident? Oh, um, there were two members of aftercare allocated to two people, so one per person, and then they would have been taken upstairs to their dressing rooms. No, no, I'm asking you, did you go to Mr McLennan, did you go to Mr Kyle and say, that was out of order, that was wrong, you humiliated these people, you exposed their vulnerabilities, you played on them, your, your, your style was overly aggressive. My concern is for... No, can I sorry. ask you, on that specific incident we saw, did you go to the head of production or the executive producer or Mr Kyle and say that was wrong? My main concern on that, uh, on that part would be to make sure that the, both of those people had adequate support and that I would have done. Uh, you've got to remember that uh, senior members of production are watching that part and if in their yep. opinion their presenter uh, behaved uh, any way other than reasonable, it is for them to address that. But you that. said it's not a binary choice, you didn't have to go and look after the, the guests at the choice of not speaking to Mr Kyle or Mr McLennan. You could easily have done both and I would imagine that it would have been in your remit to have done both. Did you do both? I didn't speak to uh, the presenter or the um, series producer on that occasion. So were you professionally comfortable with what you saw? I'm never professionally comfortable with black and white statements. OK. I'll come back to you a moment, Mr Steiny, but on, on Mr McLennan, on that clip as well, you referred to it a moment ago and you said that in defence of what we saw, you said that there was two mental health nurses in shot... Now, I, I was under the opinion that mental health nurses were there to treat people with mental illness. Did these people, in, were these people involved in need of mental health nurses? No, sorry, a, a part of, um, I thought that was explained, I, it obviously wasn't very clear. Um, part of Graham's team, there are two special um, mental health nurses that um, are part of... Uh, it's a continuity of yeah. care, so uh, the, the assessing team then goes through into the support team and then the support team into the aftercare yes, team. Yes, but the, the, so the, the two people you referred to in that clip, yeah. were they mental health nurses? Yes, they were. They were mental health nurses. Yeah. So, in your opinion, Mr Stanley, were the subjects in need of mental health nurses? No, they were needing, uh, in that particular case, uh, they were need, in need of... A, a very calm environment after that event. I th and just come back to Jeremy's style. I mean, we, Jeremy's, you know, he's been on the show for 14 years. He was on the radio before then. He's always had the same style. This isn't a new style that's changed. He is hard and he's honest, but people absolutely loved him, and that's why they applied, you know, um, t and, 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 and wanted to appear on the show. Yeah, and that's why we have something called a duty of care. We okay. took our duty of care incredibly well, well, seriously. Well, 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 yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come to that. Um, Mr Stanier, what was your career path before you became Director of Aftercare and Jeremy Clancho? Um, I uh, spent many years as a registered general nurse um, in the NHS. Uh, then when I left the NHS, I worked for many years in occupational health with an interest in mental health in the workplace. And then I took a period of time studying for four years 
studying psychology and psychotherapy and then received a master's degree. And do, do you, you have a, a, a professional qualification in, in psychology? I've studied modules of psychology, but I have a professional qualification in psychotherapy, which is often it happens that people will finish their first degree and then take a second degree uh, and do postgraduate studies to study psychotherapy, which is more an intervention, a talking therapy. So you, you, are, are you registered with the Health and Care Professionals Council? I am registered with the UKCP. But not with the Health and Care Professionals no. Council? Okay. Who on the production was the person that was that fully qualified psychologist who was qualified um, with the, uh, and registered with the Health Care Professionals Council? So uh, G G Graham was the head of our aftercare. So the, 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 there's nobody who has the, the professional qualification in psychology that's registered with the uh, Health Care uh, Professional Council? Like, like I said, it, Graham was the head of our aftercare, um, and um, yeah. Okay, um, Mr. Tanya, who acted as your professional second opinion when you were you were um, on on the show, and what qualifications did your second opinion have? Second opinion. So, uh, did you did you work in isolation? Or no, I work in a team. Yes, but, but you, you're the head of the team, so you're the head. So you look after people who apply to come on to the show. Yes. And then you look after them once they're on the show, and then you look after them when they've left the show. Yes. And so, first of all, is there not a conflict? Do you not see that there could possibly be a conflict there in, in, in what you do? And secondly, surely with that volume of people with that amount of care required, I thought it would be standard practice for a, a medical professional to have a, a second opinion or someone they have that second opinion. We have four, four, four members of the team and we work as a team and we have supervision with each other within that team. Uh, we discuss things openly within that team so we support each other. There's a team of four and we support each other. Uh, if I need any uh, medical intervention then I can contact the doctor for instance I might need uh, a medical examination on someone that's going uh, to rehab to check out their suitability medically yeah sorry I'm, I'm, working, I'm just checking my notes but so, so you, you never felt the need for any level of secondary support or I get secondary secondary support from my team okay but okay so you don't have a, a professional secondary opinion of someone who is a qualified psychologist who is registered with the health and... In terms of yeah. a second person to uh, uh, say someone is suitable? Well, yes. I mean, <laughs> no, that system doesn't exist. OK. Because I'm reading... I did read that evidence from the Association of Clinical Psychologists is the only psychologist regulated by an independent statutory body, in this case the HCPC, should be carrying out assessments or directing decisions about psychological care for, for participants. Uh, governance and accountability are absolutely key. Only a regulation can guarantee these. But that doesn't seem to be the case, and because there is nobody who is that HCPC qualified, is there? No, we have uh, a, a team who uh, supervise each other and work as a team. OK, can I add in Mr McLennan and Mr Bellamy, why is there nobody from who, that a member of the Health and Care Professionals Council embedded with this team? I think this is something we're going to have to come back to you on. Um, we're going to have to look into and write to you. I think the short answer is that we felt confident that the duty of care processes were robust yeah. and um, uh, as you say we you know, um, uh, and the team relied on Graham and his aftercare team um, so we were confident in the processes. Are you still confident? Yes I am still confident in the processes. I think you, you, the, 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 the duty of care I know how uh, seriously duty of care was taken um, and um, w whether it's about informed consent or, or, or treating people fairly or any aspect of health and welfare, I know how serious and, 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 uh, it was taken and how extensive and detailed the policies are. Saying that, look, of course, you know, one of the things we always try and do, whether it's on this show or any show uh, across ITV Studios, is not perfect, 
I'm sure we could always improve. We are constantly striving to improve um, our duty of care processes, and we, you know, we, we continue to do that. Okay. So, Mr. McLean, why why is there nobody on the team who is has a professional qualification in psychology, and no one on the team who is registered with the Health and Care Professionals Council? No, I think um, you know it's it's it's. It, at the moment, uh, there's there's a review going across the whole of ITV, and this was happening before um, um, before the uh, the the, the uh, car show finished, um, which is Dr. Litchfield is going through everything. But we have a risk risk management team um, that you know everything has gone through and checked. Like a, like a Julian said, you know we, we we really did take our duty of care very seriously 14 years ago, and we you know it is something that evolved over a period of time. We, um, you know, constantly putting in extra people. Um, you know, went from a team of one to a team of four. We added uh, residential rehabs. Um, we, um, you know, bought a, a doctor that we could use uh, within the show as well. And it was so something that we were constantly looking at and constantly um, okay. updating. And, 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 and can I just say that the uh, the the team itself are. Um, qualified ex and highly experienced, competent in carrying out assessments. They've been trained within the NHS to carry out mental health assessments. Uh, they've been trained in the NHS to carry out risk assessments. They've been trained within the NHS to carry out psychometric testing. And that's why they have the title of specialised uh, registered, registered mental health practitioners. Okay, thank you. A couple of final questions, Mr Stanier. How many times did you stop someone going onto the stage immediately prior to filming? Oh, I think I heard some statistics um, the other day. The, the assessment is ongoing, it's continuous from the moment we speak to them and, from, and to the moment they leave the stage and then beyond that. Um, at that point, it's a face-to-face -face assessment, maybe um, 50. 50 out of how many shows have been, did you say? 50 in the whole year. Yeah, we've made, we've made over 3,000 shows. Over 3,000 shows. Did you ever stop a recording of a show? <coughs> Sorry, somebody coughing. Did you ever stop the recording of a show? Um, I have when somebody has been um, distressed and it, and it wasn't a, a conflict part, but they were upset, they were reliving something, they were upset, recording was stopped and they were taken off the stage. Uh, if I felt it was necessary, certainly. So you've interrupted recording. Did you, did you ever interrupt a recording when Mr Kyle was confronting one of the guests? Okay, as a standard rule, every guest is told as we walk down to theatre with them, Every guest is told at any point, if you feel uncomfortable, just walk off the stage. Yeah. I think that's probably why people see that so often. And then on the left and the right of the stage will be two um, aftercare members. And, but they're always informed at any point you feel uncomfortable yeah. on stage. But, but did you off. professionally ever intervene to stop a recording when you thought Mr Kyle had overstepped the mark? No, I prefer to work with the guests and say, if you feel uncomfortable, leave the stage. Okay. How many times after the recording of a show did you say, this show should not be broadcast? I, I Shall I tell you how that works? Well, I will speak to the guests after the show. If they have any concerns whatsoever... No, I'm, I'm asking... Uh, 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 what I'm trying to get at is your professional responsibility, not someone's desire to be on the television or someone's no, no, fear of upsetting the production team. Your professional no. responsibility, when, when, if ever, did you go to Mr McLennan and say, this programme should not be broadcast, in my because, professional opinion? How many times? No, but because why would I say that? I'm trying to understand why. Well, OK. For example, the clip that we saw of the... The, 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 the people dreadfully, dreadfully upset by being called up, uh, the, the lie detector claiming they're a liar. Has, was there never a point after the recording of a show that you went to Mr McLennan and said, for the good of this couple or this individual's mental health, this programme should not be broadcast? Yes, absolutely. You have. In conversation with How the guests. How many times? In, the com in conversation with the guests, 
uh, if they raise any issues of concern that have happened during their uh, participation on the show, I don't raise it directly with Mr McLean, okay. but I do raise it with the producer of that show. Okay. So how many times have you made that intervention and how many times have they acted on it and not broadcast an episode? They always act on it. They okay, will so then... how many times are we talking, have, have they on your say-so not broadcast? Every time I make a recommendation, Which is it's followed. How many? How many? How many episodes of Jeremy Kyle are sitting in a shelf, non-broadcast? Because a on you that, said I, don't I, I broadcast could potentially it. put a number on it. Um, we could uh, at any one year. We would um, we would potentially over-record by eighteen shows. So um, and it, we would uh, drop parts if we felt it was necessary. Um, and at any point, what I really want to make very clear is that if Graham ever said to us that he felt a, a part of a show should not go out, that part would be dropped, and okay. he would have the final say, okay. not, not the executive. Could you say. then, could you find out, looking back in your records, how many times Mr Stanley has come to the production team and said, for the mental well-being of the participants, this should not be broadcast, and could you write to us and tell us that exact we can, number. We can look into it, yeah. It, it, it would be through the conversations he's well, had be a paper with, trail. with the guests. Yeah, there we must we, be a paper Oh, yeah, there's, there's paper so, trail on every single uh, person who appears on the show. So we can definitely look into how many shows were dropped or parts were dropped through conversations with Graham. Okay, I uh, And I can try to get that to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Can I just confirm on this point, Mr. Stanley? You, <clears throat> is the case you can't recall at the moment? A single occasion where you've made that recommendation that a story should not be broadcast because I do make those recommendations that after the show, uh, if it's raised with me, which would it would be with one of the aftercare members, I would then go into that room. I would have a, a long chat with them, and then if there were concerns, then I would no. I, I would say that I would then raise it with the producer, and then it becomes a production's responsibility to take it up to another level. Okay, so. But, so you're saying you have done that. You have made yes. recommendations to the production team that a particular story should not be broadcast. Yeah. And Mr. Clannan, have, have you? Could, could, do you know that you've acted on that advice? One hundred percent. If I, I, I can. Say I, know, I know you're saying what's the policy you would do, but I'm saying it specifically. Yes. Um, you, you you believe you have not broadcast stories. Not one hundred percent. Because if, Mr. Stanley if, recommended. If Graham, not. Has, if Graham has said to me, yeah, not, I know that's it, but I mean, did, 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 did you know, yeah, no, I, no, I'm saying absolutely. Yeah, yeah. If, if Graham has said to me a story should not be broadcast, and I have stopped it from being broadcast. And uh, because obviously the contestant, the well, contestant, I suppose it is contestant because it is an entertainment program. The, the, the member of the public who's on the show has got no right to request that their no, footage. We can they've, signed, they've signed away all rights that they have but we when they take part of the show. Plenty of examples, um, not even recently and further back, that we have, um, you know, stopped broadcasting certain stories for, for those reasons. Paul Farrelly. Thank you, Chair. Um, my, my reaction when uh, ITV announced, and I say ITV, I've got great respect for ITV and many of the people who work there and the job it does, but my reaction was uh, when this was cancelled was uh, good riddance, quite frankly. Mm. Um, I've only come across this programme two or three times, as when I was having my hair cut uh, years ago in Clerkenwell, and the barber used to have it on uh, incessantly. I couldn't change the channel, so I changed my hair cutter. Um, and I just think it's a, a form of trash television. Um, predatory programming brought in from the US that people involved in making should be ashamed of themselves, actually. Uh, ironically, as we sit here, um, it was two politicians, or former politicians, Jerry Springer, and Rob Kilroy Silk who debased themselves in fueling the genre. So not before time, as far as I'm concerned. Um, Brendan's covered most of the uh, uh, questions, that I, additional questions I was going to ask of Mr. Stanley. But I, I must say, not having seen the programme, I was quite shocked um, by the clip that we, that we saw, which was, despite the unreliability of lie detector tests, which is widely acknowledged, um, the presenter, in people's faces were saying, were saying, this test says you're a liar. They take that as a liar. And yet you, Mr. McLennan, um, rather like a, a salesman of a dodgy product, were pointing to the small print that was on the screen, but not, not available to the uh, contestant or guest, to justify that behavior. How would you view that comparison? 
Well, I, I completely disagree. I think the, um, as I said earlier, it, it's about informed consent for me. Um, and we could not have been more clear with the guests um, that applied to come on the show. Um, not only had they been viewers of the show, so they absolutely knew the content, um, but we would make it very clear to them uh, about the accuracy of the lie detector before they travelled to Manchester where we filmed, before they took the lie detector and before they appeared on the show. And then on top of that, we uh, made it very clear to the viewer, I'll repeat, the lie detector is designed to indicate whether somebody is being deceptive. Practitioners claim it to have a high level of accuracy, although this is disputed. So I don't... It, it was very important to us that everybody was informed from the contributor to the viewer. That's clearly, as people have pointed out, not reflected in the behaviour of the, the, the presenter on a programme of which you're the executive producer. I've been on this committee for 14 years now. We've had some characters in front of us. And I must say, your attempts at justification put you in a sad category of your own, as far as I'm concerned. Um, Mr. Stanley, um, you're, um, as a, you're registered with the... I just looked them up. I'm not familiar with them. The UK... Uh, uh, Council for Psychotherapy. Yes. That's correct. Um, I don't know the organisation, but from your, um, with your description of your role as a medical profession, to um, use a broad category, it's sort of rather analogous uh, to some, somebody uh, from the medical profession watching a dangerous driver using a behaviour like that and saying it's not his, his role to ask the driver to slow down or take the foot off the accelerator but your job is really to put people on a stretcher afterwards. Um, it's a strange uh, view of a, of a professional's uh, duty. No, I, I, I do believe that um, people have choice and they make a choice to, do, to go on the show. It's about making sure that they're fully informed and that's just not by production. It is part of the process that we do that as well. Um, and then... It's a continuous assessment, and throughout that assessment, we're constantly, constantly saying to them, we're Gals Welfare, we're here to support you, uh, we are the team that you need to support you. We will do that all the way down to the studios, take them to the studios, and then inform them that at any point that you feel uncomfortable, then please leave the stage, we're going to be here waiting for you. Um, we're just working with the guests constantly. And I'll just go back to the point that I believe that the presenter, his style, his language is something that is part of the production team and not part of guest welfare. Oh, that's of course, his language, when you said, when you, on here, that black and white language, you know, you're a liar, it's not something I would, I would use. It's not, not the language I would use. But going back to Mr. Hara's points, uh, I mean, you, you seem to be a professional voyeur of car crashes and see your job just to, just to put the bones back together afterwards. If I think you have to look at that. it. Um, do you want a guest welfare programme on the Jeremy Cowell show or not? Somebody has to do that job. I'm quite happy to do that job. I like looking after people. I like uh, treating people in terms of... I like the aftercare programme that I've created for them, sending people off to mediation, sending people off to rehab, sending off people off for relationship counselling, for counselling. You know, I've been afforded uh, a great budget to help people. So, yeah, I... It's not just the bit that's on the stage, it's what happens in aftercare. I've been afforded opportunities to help in an enormous amount of people. And to be paid a lot of money out of that great budget, no doubt. Can I, can I, can I just add that and this, this year alone we've put 13 people through rehab. Uh, they, they've been in there three months at a time. We've spent 122 hours of paid counselling, of uh, mediation and anger management, uh, and approximately 95... Uh, per, per year referred to free services. So, you know, we, I, I know when you see clips on YouTube or, or clips at the hairdressers in isolation, you know, it probably doesn't feel like it, but I, the, the reason we really wanted to come here today was to make it very clear that we, you know, we know the show was controversial, but we did take our duty care very seriously, beginning, middle and end. I'm going to, just as a matter of curiosity, what, how big is the budget that you've given? Sorry? How big is the budget you've given? The budget. Yeah. It was. I, I was never ever aware of a budget. Uh, but what? Just ever. Big. So when he said budget, I've never ever said to Graham at any point that he couldn't do something because of money. Okay. We've just always. I make a it. request and then and it goes. Through. I just want to. Um, uh, I just want to. Uh, clearly, your, the limitations of your your role <clears throat> pretty much self-imposed, quite frankly, um, uh, have been quite evident through the answer. But could I just uh, ask finish asking one question? Um, what's 
sometimes what's uh, the best advice to give a patient who comes home um, and is distraught that they've, um, they've uh, tested positive for HIV medically? In what is experience? the best advice? Yeah, what, what can be some of the best advice to give someone who's distraught who's tested positive for HIV? Well, it's often to uh, go back and have another test because of the, the false positives. So when people fail lie detector tests, did you ever advise the programme that perhaps they, uh, they were so distraught that they might just take them again? No, I didn't advise You didn't? That. Ever? No. Okay, enough said. Thank you. Julian Lloyd. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Stanley, you said earlier about how you were saying to participants that should they become particularly distressed or under pressure, they just walk off the stage. That's correct, isn't it? Is that what you said earlier on? In the, after the show? In, in, in the show. You told Mr O'Hara, I believe, that you often said before they went on air that if you find it too much... Yes, you please just, walk, just off. walk off. OK. Ms McLennan... Um, when they walk off stage, they're still in camera, aren't they? Yes. So they're sat there. These, so you, you, Mr. Stanley, you say that these people are then met by aftercare specialists. Is that right? These people have a clipboard and a earpiece. The earpiece is sent to the gallery, is it not, Mr. Clement? So it's actually slightly different. So on the um, uh, Jeremy Carr show, so you're absolutely right. A talk back position would yes, normally talk be, back. yeah, would normally be in the gallery. Right. Um, in, 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 in this instance, with Jeremy Carr show, we the point is, Mr. Clement, you're in touch with them. That's correct, is it not? Yeah, but we were okay. on the floor. So, so that's fine, that's, that's good. Okay. okay, so you're in touch with them. So these people, especially you're, you're saying to them, Mr. Stan here, basically, you're really distressed. We just walk off, it's okay. Then they're put with a member of your production team, and then effectively they become part of their entertainment once again. They're still in camera, they're still basically, you're instructing your individual, effectively keep them within camera. You'll be basically asking them to place them within camera and keep them within camera. So what you're effectively doing is a moment of distress that you have said to them, a way out, you, Mr McLennan, are then effectively creating an environment for them to the future, for further exploit that stress at the sides. That's correct, isn't it? I don't agree with the, uh, the word exploit. Um, I think Well, apart from entertainment, there's no privacy, there's no space. This is not a get-out. This is basically, effectively, a means by which to create greater tension, greater drama on the show, they go off stage, and then you further, effectively, exploit them. Part of the entertainment, their distress, they've signalled to you a stop, effectively. They've said to you, I need to get off, because Mr Stanley has advised them of that. But instead of actually effectively allowing them off the stage, allowing them peace and privacy to regather their thoughts, you, Mr McLennan, effectively constructed a production that then effectively allows them to be exploited further, to remain part of the entertainment when Mr Stanier has told them that effectively by doing this, they are not part of the entertainment. I, I, I don't agree with the, the word exploit. I, like I said, I think everybody was completely fully informed of, 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 of the show. They, they, they'd viewed it for many years. So they're cognizant of TV production standards, and then the TV station works. I was works. trying to explain earlier the, the, um, the talkback position. The reason why that was on the floor was because then at any point a producer or an aftercare person like Graham could come over and talk to the person in talkback um, we could take the show to break, or, or there was lots of things that we but, could do. Uh, well, uh, well uh, the, the views I've ever had of it, and I've looked on YouTube, etc. Basically, it's a moment of drama. They storm off the stage, they're stopped by a person with a clipboard and a microphone in their ear, they're kept in camera, and then effectively, they then stay there, and they, maybe your, your production person talks to them, etc. But all the while, their distress, when they think they're in a safer space, when they're achieving a safer space, their distress is there for people's entertainment. Well, like I say, I think it comes back to form. They, they would have watched the show. That is something that would happen on the show. So, um, you know, it comes, comes back to informed consent for me. But the, um, you know, what, what we're talking about is the beginning, middle and, and, and after of aftercare. And actually what we're talking about is I I even in those moments where tensions were high, there was members of Graham's team with them. Okay. Uh, but they're, they're on camera, so maybe the main ends of Mr. Stanley's team may be there. That's but they're, still the they're still on camera. They're still on camera. They're still part of the. They so thought they're out. Jury. They thought yeah. that was Mr. McLennan, but they're still on camera. That's that's a fact, isn't it? So let's have a look at the. Let's have a think back to the the original clip we saw. We saw an extremely distressed woman, who effectively 
her, you know, potentially her life is being, being ruined by uh, cod science with all the veracity of a toss of a coin. And, you know, in that respect, at that very moment, how certain are you? Because I was struck by something, the vulnerability of the woman, the fact that, you, that many of your participants are couples. How certain are you? And what checks are made to ensure that female participants in a relationship, or actually any woman in a relationship, is not being coerced to go onto your programme? There is not effectively. Do you, for example, interview them separately? So, um, yes, so, so through the process, so obviously we'd we talk to the individuals separately on the phone, we'd take uh, lots of notes from them, um, so we knew exactly what they wanted to say. Uh, one of the reasons for that is is that we wanted to absolutely make sure that they got out everything they wanted to say on the programme because actually it was quite a short short period of time, sometimes only 10, 15 minutes. So we'd have those conversations uh, with them the night before. On the day of, we would um, separate them um, and we would go back through them with the, the, the notes and we would make sure that they completely understood everything that they've told us and make sure that they were, you know, basically pre-interviewed before they went on to the show, so they were fully informed. Isn't there a danger here that you are effectively facilitating I a form of emotional, emotional violence? Sorry, Mr. I, could, I could answer that question. That Once they, we do it face-to-face -face and they're in uh, individual rooms, you will ask that question about whether they've been coerced or they've been put under any pressure to do the, uh, to do the show. So you just say, we've been under pressure. Do you sort of, in any way, do you... Uh, uh, embellish that in any way? Do you sort of ask a particular situation? Because presumably it's one person has contacted you. It is. It, we, they, uh, you will go, so once they arrive uh, at the studios, they're then allocated individual rooms, mm -hmm. and then you will always do a face-to-face -face check with them that morning before they go to their studio, to go to the studio. And it's really important that we do, because they're now, often the uh, evaluations are probably being overheard by somebody, maybe if it's a telephone conversation, but you do have to make sure that they feel safe and that they haven't been put under pressure or coerced to come to the show. So you really want to know that it's something they want to do. And what about the interplay between different uh, re relationships? That, I mean, my, my concerns are effectively that there may be very vulnerable women, effectively, who are, uh, who are, who are presented with a suspicion by their partner that they've yes. been, you know, they been unfaithful, etc., as we saw in, the, in that clip. Yeah. And uh, effectively what then happens is that uh, that, that suspicion then is, is then aired in public and that this is deeply emotionally damaging, yeah. reputationally, but also is part potentially of a more abusive relationship. I agree. I totally and, agree. And, and so what safeguards you have that, that is not part of a more abusive relationship, that you aren't effectively at the tail end a part of a process of abuse? I, I am pro I'm totally aware of, the, of, of those concerns and it is part of that process that we do talk to people separately when they're on their own because you really do want to um, establish that no, you know, they haven't been put under pressure or coerced to do a test uh, in order to prove uh, fidelity mm. uh, and that you want to exclude at all costs that there is any there has been physical altercations in that relationship or violence in that relationship. Mm. And another additional check that we will carry out is what we call source checking. So as part of the whole process, we will speak to two people who have been nominated by the guest, and then we will speak to these two people and make that line of inquiry whether they are aware of any issues within that relationship. Is there, have there been any... Um, any violence within that relationship. So again, we're trying to check on those issues. What constantly. do you do when you discover there has been violence in the relationship? It would be gone. It would be over. Well, the, what would they wouldn't. Be, they, it wouldn't happen. But is that where is that where your duty of care ends effectively? The, effectively no, absolutely not. It, uh, so if you speak to somebody and they decline to come on the show, it absolutely doesn't end there at all. It could be any situation. Some people are not engaging with national, you know, with uh, NHS services. You would encourage them to do that. People who are uh, obviously in uh, relationships and it's been disclosed that there may be a victim of domestic violence, then of course we need to reassure them that there are uh, agencies out there that can help and support them. Yeah, absolutely. When we decline somebody and say that you, it's not possible for you to participate for whatever reason, it's not an end point for us. We do have to... Uh, put them in whatever service they would find helpful. When you say put them in whatever service, what does that actually entail? 
In terms of, so if you identified when somebody was on the phone that they, uh, they had depression, then you would recommend that they went to see their GP and have the GP evaluate them. It sounds the sort of if I should get off someone on the bus, frankly. It's I mean, what? This, this sounds like the sort of if I should get off from someone on a bus rather than a, uh, a trained medical practitioner. So what is it actually you actually do do? If you discover that someone coming on trying to come onto your show or you discover afterwards that someone has been a victim of domestic violence, what do you actually do apart from, say, just go and see your GP? No, no, no. And if I was talking about depression. And when it's a victim of domestic violence, I'm definitely going to send them to or advise them or one of the team is going to advise them to uh, seek help from uh, domestic violence units. It is important. You, you don't just leave it. I mean, you've identified... Uh, that there is violence in that relationship, then you need to progress that forward. Okay. Now, there's been participants who've been in touch with the, the select committee, and they've told us that their impression was that there simply wasn't any aftercare. Why do you think they've said that? Mr McClellan? It's, it's very difficult for me to answer. I think, you know, the, the main reason I wanted to come t today was to make sure that we, we, we expressed to you that there was, we had a you know, a proper duty of care. We, there was a um, guest welfare was very important to us, and that we that that extended from before, during, and after the show. That's not um, what your participants said, though. They said effectively that they they don't feel there's any aftercare. See, I I I, I don't know who you're talking about, so it's very difficult for me to comment. Right. But this that that simply wouldn't be the case, Mr. Bowen. If I may, it's very hard to answer. In in fairness, in, in, in the abstract, and look, any time we're made aware of any concerns, um, it is something that we look into, um, uh, and certainly happy to look into you know, any, any any other concerns that you may have, or any of the participants' of concerns. I, I would just you know, echo again that I know how seriously duty of care is taken, um, and I would also just echo again um, my point about um, uh, Ofcom and uh, the amount of. Yeah, I, I, I know that you, you've fallen back a the, the few times. I mean, we've obviously concentrated on Mr. McLean, Mr. Stanley, who joined this, this, this hearing. In the few times that you, you have spoken, you've fallen back on Ofcom. Frankly, most people don't know about Ofcom. I have any idea about it whatsoever. So I really don't think it's particularly in a, a... I know it's one thing that you may wish to fall back on, but I don't really think that here today, I don't think that's a particularly sort of robust defence of your programme. The fact that, that people who, who may actually, frankly, have many serious issues don't know where Ofcom is or don't go and complain to Ofcom. So, I mean, that's great, but I don't really think that's a particular thing. But what if I was to say to you that you just said how, you know, how you're very happy. In fact, you've said before how you're, you're reassured by the, the duty care, the aftercare that's happened. If I say to you that the letter to, the, to participants states the following. If necessary, if necessary, council sessions will be arranged, but that, of course, is completely up to you whether you want to take up this help. To what proportion are participants actually offered counselling and also what criteria decisions are they, you know, is counselling based and who do participants call? I mean this doesn't sound like a sort of open invitation, this sounds like if necessary, of course it's completely up to you whether or not you want to take up any of this help. It just sounds to me as if frankly it's there, it's almost like giving someone a leaflet, off you go. It doesn't seem to me frankly that this is anywhere near robust enough for ITV Studios to have his name associated with? Uh, I, I, I don't think that's right. I mean, I, I, I again, know first-hand from, from, you know, seeing uh, Graham and the team at work that, that it, they have a very, you know, um, um, robust set of duty of care um, procedures. Um, Graham talked up probably more directly to that, the point you raise than I, me. I, I think it's about, you know, why that was like that, because obviously today we're talking about the conflict resolution parts, but quite often we would do reunion parts, and obviously if somebody was being reunited with their long-lost father who they hadn't seen for 20 years, you know, they were very happy and they potentially might not need counselling. So it's, it's, it, it couldn't be a one-fit-for-all, it had to be case by case. So you're comfortable leaving it entirely up to participants? Whether or not they're offered to take up counselling, it would be. It would, sorry, it would be. It would be for Graham and his team to have that conversation with the participants. That's why they would always be seen before they left the studio. Isn't this two hands off? Isn't the whole th hasn't the whole thing been two hands off for I many years? I mean, the culture. You've been you've been as a program for fourteen years, isn't it? Cultures do grow up. 
do you recognise now that potentially the aftercare has been too hands off? I think, I think, like I said at the beginning, this is something that we took seriously 14 years ago, but it is absolutely something that's evolved, you know, through time. Um, and and we were still looking at we were still it was still evolving. Mm. So it isn't just a process that had got old and not fit for service. It was a, it was something that we were constantly refreshing and looking at. Well, how have you refreshed it recently? Like I said earlier, you know the uh, the uh, in-house uh, rehabs that we now you know give 13 people this year. This is only something we bought in the last few years. We've uh, taken the last up sorry, two to three last few years. Four. How many years? How many years? Um, I couldn't give, I, I'm trying to think now, probably three or four years. Three or four years, so yeah. basically one quarter of the time that Jeremy Cowell has been on air. You've the, had 3,000 The checklist and everything, we were just, we were refreshing, we were looking at at the moment, seeing if we could be improved. Um, like I said, we have, um, we, were, we were going through all processes once again, even before before the exiting of the show. It's, it's uh, you know, I, I just think that's a really important point, that it isn't something that we'd have taken our eye off, because it, that isn't the case. Final question, uh, Mr Stanier. Uh, what referrals have been made to GPs or mental health services after sessions? Referral to GPs or mental health services? Yeah. Uh, we would probably, if and when required, so often, uh, yes, we would certainly recommend for people to go and see GP services uh, if we had cons referrals. So is that, is that what you term a referral to say a recommendation effectively? Is that what you'd say? It would depend. If, if, if you had concerns regarding someone's mood level, you would refer them to, you would discuss that with them. With them. Uh, this, these people may not even go on the show. They may have just chaperoned somebody. We may have had a chat with them prior to the show. We, we, there may be people that have been declined, but they wanted to come to the show because they had friends coming to the show. If they had been declined because of low mood, then obviously, not obviously, it's what we do. We will refer them to GP service. We will express our concerns uh, that they've got low mood and then go to your GP, have your GP carry out an evaluation of your mood. So we're trying to engage people with services. Okay, well, well that's, that's, you, you're full of buzzwords, but I, I, I don't really see any particular practicality sort of end point at that. You seem to be saying, like, okay, well, off you go, almost like the, you know, off you go, there you are, you should be going to see a doctor. What, what does actually result in? I mean, you talked about uh, the idea of uh, a rehab before, but in terms of mental health and GP services, do you not take any more further part than that? You know, you've, you've, you've put these people on air, and then effectively you're taking. Oh, these were people prior to air, sorry. After, um, we will see people, it's about problem, it's about solution. And I suppose my focus is always on what's the problem that you bring, and then at the end of the show we can do a needs assessment, what's the solution I can provide for you. Thank you. Thank you. Clive Evans. Thank you, Chair. Can I just go back to the, um, the checklist? So, so someone indicates that they want to go on the show, and there's an initial telephone conversation, uh, and that, that's followed up um, with uh, uh, somebody of the production team ringing up, going through this checklist. Does everyone who indicates that they would like to go on the show get this follow-up call with this checklist? Um, yes. So, 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 so everyone who was going to appear on the show would, would go for this checklist? Yes, and but does everyone who contacts the show, um, following that initial conversation, get called back with, uh, to go through this, this contact list? Does this checklist? It would... So, is everyone... Take, taken through this checklist who indicates they want to go on the show I think um, so is there some sort of sift that goes on in the first phone call I think actually since GDPR came in I think um, I think this is something that we had to we had to have certain scripting for so actually uh, we'd we'd have this conversation we'd, we'd read this out to, to pretty much everybody who appeared on the show so, so there's no form of vetting process in the initial contact whatsoever this is it this is this, this is the this is what they call the chasing uh, okay so when you yeah. when we go through this if you I think it's just been updated it, it, it was going to be updated so can I just ask you very briefly yeah. about the question on page three which is about education yes um, what type of school was it what level of education re reached out but at the end in the, uh, the box it's got for official use only Google the school yeah. What are we looking for there? So, um, like, I think that that. So, I just want to make sure that the. I think that we we would only come to this bit, and we would only kind of get to that level of detail if 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 this was seriously being considered to be on the show. 
Right. We would the, maybe start filling it out, but then we'd only get to that detail if we uh, if it was going to be appearing in the show. But this is the this is the the, the, the questions that, that uh, are being asked by uh, the, the the member of the production team on the telephone. Yeah. So presumably but, they go through all these questions. Do they all is it? Well, they go through these questions. I think they'll probably they'd, they'd speak to some of the script. They'd hear what some of the story was like. Uh, we'd, we'd obviously speak to them and, and find out kind of the reason why they wanted to come on the show. Um, we would then speak to the other person and find out why they wanted, if they, if they would want to come on the show as well, and then we'd start getting through the checklist. So it would be quite early, it would be quite early stages that we'd go through the checklist. We'd probably get the understanding of both, both people wanted to appear on the show before we got to the checklist, to be completely clear. Right, so there'd be, a, be quite a bit of sort of toing and froing between individuals before you, anyone is we'd have, we'd, 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 gone through this checklist. Yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd so there is some sort of sift before the checklist then? Well, there'd be a conversation, yeah. Or Zunds, conversations. Yeah. All right, yeah. so, so, so what are we looking for when we, uh, we, we look for someone's school? So I think, uh, I think that would be for lots of different reasons. As, as somebody said earlier, this is why we talk to... Um, we talk to... Um, to people who are related to the story, for one, to see if they're telling us the truth, if people are lying about their history or anything, then that would obviously be red flags. I think it's also, if we looked up the school and it would be a, you know, a school for, you know, potentially spe special needs, um, then that would be red flags to us. I mean, we're, we, so, so we're, not, we're not looking at, uh, you know, targeting people from different types of schools? No, no, it's, you know, it's, if, 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 if something came up, that it would it be was very a, welcome on your programme. No, if it came up and it was a school that of, of special needs, then obviously that would be a, a red flag and something we'd want to look into more. But that wouldn't be a, an exclusion, it would be something that we'd want to look into more. Okay, and there's also a question on here about um, uh, uh, where you indicate to someone that they should check people's uh, social media history. What, what are you looking for there? So that is, again, to verify the story. Um, you know, it's very important to us as... as you know, the show was a tabloid show, um, and it was important for us to make sure that everybody who came on the show, you know, was telling us the truth. Very occasionally, uh, people would try to come on the show and make up a story. Um, so, one good thing about social media is if we went back, you know, normally you could, you know, you could see if uh, if if what they were telling us was the truth. And so, and are we looking for people with problems when we look? On social media. Well, they would they would have already called us with a problem, so the problem was right. pre-existing, um, and then we were, would go back and verify that. Okay, so when we go through this uh, checklist, there's um, there's quite a few references to whether, whether if the answer is yes on violence, on drugs, on uh, you know various aspects, psych psychology, you know, counselling, social worker, um, yeah, any disorders like eating disorders, OCD, etc. Yeah. And, and against all these uh, these ones, it says uh, refer uh, to the aftercare team. Yeah. Um, now, if this is prior to going on um, uh, be, being selected to you know participate in the show, um, is is referring to the aftercare team code for this person should go on the show? No. I think we made that no. very clear that you know th this is this is the number one reason why we wanted to to be so open with you and talk about it. You know, I know that people when they see this, this show they would sometimes think it was controversial and everything else, but this the duty of care was incredibly important to us, and I can't stress that enough. And we 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 put these procedures in place, um, and and why so many people did not end up on the show because we took we couldn't take have taken this more seriously. So. The, the, there's not a disproportionate number of people um, who are referred to the aftercare team at this level, the, at this stage of the checklist, who, no, I, who appear on the show. I mean, Graham might, might disagree. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd say, you know, over the years, because the systems and procedures, you know, were, were tightened and got stronger and stronger, there probably wasn't many people or many stories, you know, at some point did not, you know, um, get referred to aftercare, and then every single person had a face to face, you know, before they. Um, before before the recording started. Yeah, I've got, I'm really just trying to get at it. Is, is is there a disproportionate number of people who at this stage you know, going through this checklist um, that are referred to aftercare that end up going on the show? Well, it's it's case by case. So this is this this the whole thing is 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 is, is set up for case by case. So depending on the reason, it is why it would then go to aftercare for them to 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 assess if that person should then appear on the show. 
but it, it really was case by case. Right. So, so if if you go through this checklist and no one, you know, if somebody, an individual or a couple yeah. of individuals are not referred to aftercare, yes. you know, they, 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 you, know, you still consider them go, to go. go so, if they the didn't show. get referred to aftercare uh, and they they got through the whole uh, checklist without any flags whatsoever, then they would be free to travel to come to the show, but they would still have a face to face when they got but, to studio. But because given some of the issues that are listed here, um, you know, that that uh, you know. It's, Autism, schizophrenia, ADHD, yeah. and you know, refer to aftercare. Yeah. Um, it's quite concerning that that that, that um, you, you know, once you've identified those those needs, that you might still consider th this person for the sort of program we saw in, um, at the start of this uh, this uh, question session. You have to consider then uh, the level of participation. It might be a desire for them to be part of uh, a show. Uh, but if there are certain disclosures, and then once you've carried out the assessment, uh, there are clear that you clearly need to reduce the level of participation, then that's what uh, we would recommend to production. So, for instance, you can reduce level of participation to the point of giving a statement, maybe a video statement. Uh, sitting in a room quietly and having a private interview with the presenter, so you can act effectively uh, reduce their level and, of participation. And, and again, at that point, I'd like to say that you know, if, if Graham said to us, "Okay, you know, that person cannot appear on the show, but you know what, we would be happy for them to provide a statement," then that person wouldn't appear on the show to be recorded. But they, you know, as long as they agreed, they would then, um, you know, um, give us a statement. Right. So, so, Mr. Stane, just my, my really last question. In your professional capacity, I mean, I mean, you've seen comments from mine that are you know, saying that um, um, the programme should prioritise people's needs over the desire to make the programme. Mm. Um, I, I mean, are you comfortable with being involved I would, in this programme? I would definitely reduce people's level of participation in most cases to providing a statement only. Thank you. Charles Walker. Yes, I'd like to uh, come to the area of content, uh, what we used to call footage in the old days. Um, th there's a, 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 a wonderful uh, quotation here from the Social Inequalities Research Centre at Lancaster University, which says, the power of editing is unbelievable. A sentence constructed of two sentences said 20 minutes apart sounds and looks like it was one sentence. Now, you record the programmes and you therefore do go through some form of editing. Do the contributors have any idea or understanding of the power of editing? Is that uh, to, to me? Yeah. Um, yeah, interesting with the, the Jeremy Carr show. So it was actually a normal ITV hour would be 45 minutes. The Jeremy Carr show was actually 50 minutes. Um, we almost uh, recorded as live. Um, so we, uh, for a 50 minute show, quite often we would record, you know, 53, 54, 55 minutes. Um, and then we would take those minutes out. But you know, other shows, other daytime shows, you could you could obviously, as you, as you'd be fully aware, you know, you could record hours and hours and, and take it down to that amount. So to to, to only lose three or four minutes, um, really, what you should, saw on the show was what happened on the day. And the reason that we take those minutes down is just because we had to get it to a certain amount of time for television. And plus, if there was certain things that wasn't appropriate for a morning slot, like swearing or anything else. And we'd be able to take those but out. Would you, would you say that you, you can sometimes, as, as we know, yeah. editing is a very powerful tool. Very and, much and so, you, yeah. I know and you is. can make yeah. somebody who's telling yeah. the truth look like a liar. Yeah. And somebody who's a, who's a liar look like they're as innocent yeah. as, as, as an angel. But uh, do, do you ever use that? Do you ever use camera angles, uh, anything like that, to, to, to point up a certain angle that you from the production team might yeah. like to make? No, we, uh, I mean, the... Like I said, it, it was it was recorded as almost live with just a few minutes taken out. We weren't changing particularly camera angles in the end or anything else. So what people watched at home was what people were watching in the studio. Okay, I, I accept that. So, so Thank you. Um, are the contributors fully aware of how the programme how will use the content? How do you inform them? Yeah. How do you tell them? So we would go through, you know, as, as part of the informed consent and, and, and through all the conversations we had, people were aware that um, the show would obviously be uh, used on the, the, in the morning, obviously, uh, but the show would be repeated as well. Um, if there was a long period of time after, after the first transmission, 
we would uh, then call them back up and ask them if they minded it being repeated again. If the show was used within best of episodes, we would um, we would call them up and ask if they minded their, their participation being put in that as well. And do they, do they regularly deny you that permission? Uh, some would, because their, their lives had moved on. You know, um, the, the, the problem that they came on the show potentially a year or two years later had moved on and they, they wouldn't want to be included, let's say, in a best of show, and we would we would honour that. So if Plus, if they contacted us and asked, uh, you know, uh, had a good reason for us to not re- carry on repeating the programme, obviously it would be case by case, but we would look at that too. Okay, so, so, so fundamentally they are aware that this content that is shot yeah. is there forever. Potentially, and you could use it. Yeah, I mean, we obviously the contracts and everything said that, and what we were kind of discussing earlier. But actually, in in, in the kind of real world, it was far much um, more fluid than that. Okay, um, as part of the contract, the guests receive a special category data notice, which is about uh, ethnicity, health, um, yeah. business affairs, health and safety, compliance, aftercare. First of all. Do the contributors understand what that means? I mean, I, I'm maybe not the brightest man, but I, when I read these contracts, I, I find them heavy going. Is it made clear to your contributors exactly what this, this wording means and what it will mean in the future? I mean, it was, I, I, it's kind of, this question came up slightly earlier, and it, it, it's a difficult one to answer. Obviously, we had to put that information in, uh, particularly with the rules changing. Um, you know that was not put in by production. It was it was uh, lawyers and, and business affairs. Um, we tried to explain over a period of time um, instead of just the contract, but we would go through the contract with the contributors as well. Um, did you sit down in a room with them and, and, and take them through? Yeah, we would go. For, we would go through the contract with them. I, I, in in hindsight. I've, I've been gone through the forms in the last few days. I wonder if there is some lessons to be learned and potentially we could soften some of the language going forward. Okay, that's, uh, that's, yeah. that, that's good to hear. How long do you keep the data? So that's changed again recently. So I would need to find, obviously, you know, as you, you're aware, with GDPR, every, you know, everything is, is everything's changed. changed yeah. Everything's changed in the last few months. So um, I can't give you an exact at the moment, but I can, I can supply that to you. That would be very good. Thank you very yeah. much. And... Finally, um, do you think that contestants or contributors should have greater power over their content? Um, do you uh, just do take you mean, it and as then in the it's e- yours? editing, or well, I mean, is it is it is it uh, is it possible, or is it something that you would consider doing to allow a contributor to see what goes on in the editing suite? Would you allow them to see an edited, uh, finished um, program? I, th- I think I think that would be very difficult in in the real world. I can see why you're asking it, but I think you're you're almost offering editorial control to um, to the contributor, and I'm not sure how that would work in a real world setting. Do, do you feel so that they might be, say, "Well, this program can't go out"? Do you think that might be one of the? I, th- I just I just think it would it would be very very difficult, and I'm not sure if if it would if it would technically be possible. But surely the resources could be put there, Mr Bellamy, could, could I don't think it's, Yeah, it's not, I don't think it's a, a question of, 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 of resources. For me, it's, um, look, there's, there's certainly a question of some practicalities, but I think more fundamentally, actually, I think the system works, works well in terms of um, you know, informed consent, making sure that people are then fair, fairly and accurately um, uh, represented in the show. I, I would worry about um, uh, ensuring that producers you know, must always have editorial control to tell um, a story in a fair and accurate way as they see it. But there is, there is, there is the issue that, the, quite simply, you know, one uh, does an interview, then looks at it back afterwards and thinks, my gosh, it shouldn't go out like that, this is dreadful. And you'd like to be able to have some sort of power over how it goes out. And as you're dealing with people, in, in sometimes, in, quite often, in a very delicate stage in their life, um, do, you, do you not think that they should have some more control over what you actually find the broadcast? No, n- not if they are fully and properly informed about what they're participating in. Um, and, then, and then we are, you know, remember, you know, we are obviously operating in a you know, very tightly regulated industry, certainly in comparison to newspapers and the internet and so on. Um, so I, 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 I frankly don't personally see the need, though, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm um, I, I, I do think as well there are some practical issues with that as well. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Stevens. I just have one question. Um, Mr McLennan, you just said about how you sit the um, 
contributors down to take them through the contract and you go through it with them. At any point, do you advise them to go and get free, fair and impartial legal advice on what you are requiring them to sign? Um, No, we haven't. Thank you. Brendan O'Hara. One final question, just something I picked up in, in the language you were using about sort of going forward and sort of coupled to the, the rumours that this, uh, this could be making a comeback, do you have any plans whatsoever to bring this show back in any format with Mr Kyle as presenter? There is no. So just being very direct with you, there are absolutely no plans and we will not be bringing back um, a show that looks or feels like the Jeremy Carl show. But you don't rule out working with Mr. Taylor in the future. Well, the network have been, uh, and you know, ITV has been very um, open and transparent about that. Um, uh, we, you know, Jeremy Kyle has been involved in all sorts of programmes from Good Morning Britain to the Kyle Files, and uh, so yes, we would um, uh, be looking to work with them in the future. But nothing that remotely resembles what we the Jeremy Kyle show. Care of Jeremy Correct. Kyle show. We won't be Correct. making another conflict resolution show. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that concludes the questions uh, we have for you today. Um, we appreciate your time and we will move on to the second panel. Thank you. Thank you for your time. joining us uh, today. We appreciate your time and uh, apologise for the, over, the lengthy run of the first panels. We're starting slightly later than we had planned. Um, we do have one or two members of the committee who are rejoining us, so, but I think we'll make a start now in the interests okay. of time. Um, if I could ask, um, Karen McCall, Peter Bazalgette, you, you head up ITV, you're responsible for ITV. Mm-hmm. Um, were you surprised by some of the things you heard this morning? I imagine, I, I should ask, did you have the chance to watch the, uh, the first witness panel? We had a chance to watch some of it, not yeah. all of it. We've been waiting outside for a little while. So um, I don't think I, I'm, I'm surprised by the responses necessarily. I, I, I think that they had they tried very hard to outline to you what the processes were, what the duty of care was, uh, how they dealt with contributors, applicants and then contributors. Uh, and they talked quite a lot, I think, about the um, procedures of the show. So I think that, I think that is what it is. That's the show. But would you, I suppose the question for us is, do you feel that those standards were adequate? I think we did an internal review, as you know. Um, So when we suspended the show uh, on the 12th of May, actually, and announced it on the 13th, we uh, initiated an internal review. Now, that review was really about the episode, uh, the one episode, uh, which which we actually then cancelled the show subsequently after that. But the internal review hadn't started, and that was really about 
um, the processes that were being used on the show and were they being applied on the show. That's what the internal review mm. was about. And the conclusion of that review was that it was that, that the processes existed, they were detailed processes, and they were followed. But, do, for example, do you think it is adequate that the, produ the production arm of the programme don't know how accurate the lie detector tests are? So that was one area that I, I think what they were conveying mm. is that they made it very, very clear that lie detector tests are not 100% accurate, as you heard repeatedly. Mm. Our own, the two examiners that we use, uh, and I, I completely concur yeah. what, what, what they said, the two examiners we use, if you look on their websites, they say that the lie detector test, in their view, has an accuracy in the 90s. We have chosen never to put that on the show because of the range. The range is always disputed. So whether you look at the professor on the program or whether you look at our, the, our own in examiners that we used, who are in, uh, it's an independent company. Um, there is quite a, a range of anything from 60% that you mentioned to 95%, as they've mentioned, and they've put that. It's a matter of public record because they have that on their website. So I think what the production team were trying to convey is that they didn't use the range, they didn't use those statistics because they were in dispute, that, that there was a complete understanding that lie detector tests are not 100% accurate. They tried very, very hard, I believe, to tell every contributor that. I think you heard Graham Stanier's view of how he would deal with that in very normal language. I, rather than using statistics, he would talk about the fact that you could be telling the truth, but the lie detector test will say you are lying. That was talking to people on a one-to-one -one basis to explain. They also used to go through with uh, participants the worst consequences of a lie detector test. So they, they would actually talk to participants about what, how they would feel, what they would think if the lie detector test went against them. So from that point of view, I think what the team were trying to convey is they didn't want to put a statistic on it because the statistic would be wrong because it is so disputed. So their way of dealing with that was to say it is not 100% accurate and then to deal with that face to face with individual participants to explain that. But I think the reason we asked so many questions of it, I've looked on the website for the company that provides it, what they say on the website is exactly what the production team say to the people, which is it's not 100%. They don't, I didn't see a figure in the 90s, it just says it's not 100%. And, and, as, and as we talked about earlier, I think that statistic is meaningless because 50% is not 100%, 40% is not 100%. You know, and in the con and I, my question and my concern here is, I can't see how someone can give informed consent to take part in the lie detector test when they've got no idea of how accurate it is or even what the range of accuracy is for that test. So I, I think um, Chris can come in yeah. here as Director of Compliance. Um, both of those examiners would say that their accuracy was in the 90s. We never chose to reflect that exact figure because we know that that could be easily, that would be disputed by somebody else. So I ge genuinely think that it, it is possibly disingenuous to say to people, either that this was going to be accurate in the 90s or 70% or 80% because we don't, none of us know. There's, there are many different opinions. What I can say to you is that I, I, they went through processes to try and explain the lie detector test and why it wasn't 100% accurate. And indeed, we've now cancelled the show, as you know. And I will say that we will not commission a show uh, in the future, in this way, in this format, using lie detection sets, for the very reason you've just highlighted, which is the range is, it, the, the, the range is, it depends on who you talk to. But um, I, I, find, I find your answer slightly puzzling, actually, because on one hand you're saying they've done nothing wrong, but on the other hand you're saying we're never going to do that again. Well, I'm, I'm saying that I, they haven't done anything wrong because they have explained that lie detector tests are not 100% accurate. You may have a strong view that that should not be used. That well, you, no, you I, may I, have a view that they should be not, not be used in, in, in strong, formats. And also the strong view I have is that we're dealing with actually really vulnerable people. You know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a setting they're not used to, uh, being told that this, pro this process is, is accurate, um, and it's been presented in the programme as accurate. Jeremy Carl gives no ambiguity in the way he presents the results. No one's ever given the chance to have a retest. Uh, that was not, not offered to them. Uh, they don't have the right to stop the broadcast uh, of, the, of the footage or the test if, they don't, if they're uncomfortable with the result. They have no rights to do that at all. 
And I'm not sure in that environment, and, and the test is not even done particularly in a controlled environment, it's just done in a room at Media City um, uh, by people that don't particularly have any medical qualifications. And if so I can ass yes. assist at all with that, the, the test is done in a hotel room uh, adjacent to the studios. So the Holiday um, Inn? Holiday Inn at Media City, is that where it's done? Uh, I think you might actually be right. I think okay, it yeah, actually um, might be a controlled the medical environment? In this room? Uh, uh, it's 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 a, a quiet it's a quiet place to conduct uh, to conduct the test and done on the morning of the show. So if so someone's doing a lie detector test, probably feeling you know, it's not something they've probably done before. Might feel a bit under pressure. They had a night away in somewhere that's not their home. Um, they are you know they're taken to a room to do this test. They'll get the results shortly. It'll be on television. Probably not been on television before. That's probably quite a nerve wracking experience. You think that's the best environment to take a lie detector test? Um, it, it was generally done either the, either the day before or on the morning, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, all I would say is that the, uh, the actual polygraph examiners themselves would take each guest through quite a detailed uh, explanation of the test. So an explanation of just how it worked in terms of you know, the, phys the physiological changes that it was looking to, to capture and, um, and, and how they then ascertained the, the result, whether or not somebody was being truthful or deceptive. But, but the thing is with these, these tests, and I'm not, I'm not had anything to do that convinced me otherwise, that, that it, and most doctors or nurses who take blood, blood uh, pressure readings would say, you don't base it on one reading, you base it on several, because you know, some, some person who may not see a doctor regularly might feel a bit nervous about it, might give a high reading, and another day it's fine. You know, I would imagine someone taking a lie detector test is in the same position. And what this, te this test, this machine is not reading whether you're telling the truth or not, using special powers. It's reading your heart rate, it's reading your perspiration levels. And I think someone in a pressurised environment, you know, it may not give an accurate reading. And, he, and the, the readings that were given about 60% accuracy and so on, were actually based on it being done in a controlled medical environment, not being done in a hotel room at the Holiday Inn in Media City, the day, the day you go on telly. And, not, and, and, and I think this is so important because the whole, a lot of the premise of the show wrestles, the reason we are in this room is because of the lie detector test. Yeah, and that's why I think it's so important. Uh, and so I, what I would simply say to that is they did work hard to explain the lie detector test to anybody that would go on to show. They did use two examiners. Uh, there was not always only one test. Sometimes both examiners would do a lie detector test on the same person. Um, and, uh, and, and actually, everyone who appeared on the show did watch the show and did understand that in many, many episodes of the Jeremy Carr show, as you, as you rightly mm. say, the lie detector test was used. But I, I, don't, I don't think what they were told about the lie detector test fairly reflects the nature of the test and the accuracy of it. And I think it's interesting that no one, ha no one had the right to have a retest, no one has the right to stop the results of the test being broadcast. I, that, I, I think if someone asked for, I think Tom did say this, which is if someone asked for something not to be broadcast, we would take that on a case-by-case well, case basis. Uh, only on medical advice. Yes. Not just, you know, if someone wasn't showing to slide, you know, that would be on medical grounds. We still don't know how many times that happened. They couldn't answer that question. But we'll be interested no, they're going in the to come back to you yeah, on that. Yeah, we'll be yeah. interested in that answer. Yeah. But only on medical grounds, not on someone. You know, if someone said, look, I feel this test is a lie or I know it's a lie. Uh, I don't feel I, I, I really knew about the, the accuracy of the test before I did it. I'm not happy with it. I don't want that going on air. The answer would be, sorry, you, you know, you signed away your rights. It's, yeah, and you've got no right to have a retest either. And I'm, not, I'm not sure that is, the, that is a position to put vulnerable people in. Um, I, I, under, I understand the point you're making, Chair. Um, I, all I would say is I think most people who um, applied to take part in the show and specifically asked for a lie detector, you know, believed they wanted it because they wanted um, an answer to, a, to an uncertainty in, in their relationship or, or in some family dispute. I, I, I actually, just on the purpose of the show, yeah. which I know has been a matter of some yeah. uh, discussion in the previous panel, the intention with the lie detector from the producers of the show was for people to be honest with each other, so yeah. that it generated honesty and an outcome. And the aim of the show was to have some kind of positive outcome, some kind of reconciliation. Now, that didn't always happen. It did happen in many cases. But I think one of the reasons why people were asked to... Um, were asked about their knowledge of the show and Jeremy Carl Starr because Jeremy Carl Starr had a big impact. His, his, I think he was even, I think some of the uh, members of the first panel even called it the conflict part of the show where, where Jeremy Carl is being deliberately confrontational, he's engaging people in conflict. And I thought what was very interesting as well was when we were told that though, though people were advised if they were uncomfortable they could walk off the set, they carried, the filming carried on. They, couldn't, they weren't stopping filming, they were just being filmed in a corridor rather than on, on the set itself. Yes, well, I mean, whether you like the show or not, and I think many people like the show, 
that was the format of the show. And I think the audience understood that. And actually, the participants were often in the audience and did understand the format of the show. I suppose I think our concern is, even if people watch the show, they may not really have understood what they were getting themselves into until they were in it. And was this responsible? And was this show an accident waiting to happen? And, and Chair, one of the first questions you asked mm. was about informed consent. Mm. And I, I do think it is relevant that uh, people were asked whether they'd seen the show. Every, everybody sees mm. the show. The show is very well known. Uh, they knew what was involved. They knew the direct style of the presenter. They knew mm. how he deployed the results of the lie detector tests. And they'd seen the effect on the people taking part. And they'd seen sometimes it resolved conflicts, sometimes it didn't. They, they knew all that. So I think that does contribute to informed consent. Um, Karen, Paul, you said when um, there was a, an email you sent to ITV staff that mm -hmm. was published by BuzzFeed, I think the day after you sent it, which was, um, and you sent this email at a time when the show had been suspended, mm -hmm. not yet cancelled. Mm -hmm. It was only, I think, about a 24-hour mm -hmm. or so period between those two decisions being made. But in that, you say that the decision to suspend the show was, and I quote, not in any way a reflection on the show, but the best way we think we can protect the show and the production team from the reaction we expect to this death. Yeah. What, what did you mean by that? So that was an internal email, and it was directed at the production staff, closely involved with the Jeremy Carl show and the wider production staff. And I would say that everybody at ITV was extremely sorry uh, to have heard that someone who had appeared on the show had died quite in, in quite close proximity to appearing on the show. So what I was saying to them is, suspending the show created shockwaves in the production team. It had never happened before. It was unprecedented. And I was trying to say to them, we are going to go through this calmly and in a measured way. We are doing an internal investigation, but that is the way. In doing an investigation internally is the way to protect you all as individuals. Did That's you, what I meant by that. But did you not think it was a bit, it, it slightly preempted the internal review to say that the decision to suspend was not in any way a reflection on the show? I think what I was saying is that we, co we couldn't say that I, it, what the internal investigation was doing was we were looking at one episode of the show. We weren't looking at the whole Jeremy Kai show over 14 and a half years. And that's what I meant by that, because you can't say to a production team that it's a reflection of everything you do every day and that you've been doing for 14 years. So it was an internal email sent to specific individuals who are working at the sharp end on production, I mean, they were harassed by the media. I mean, many, many, many of them were phoned, doorstepped, talked to. Um, it, it was a very, it has been a very difficult time for people who worked on that show. So, so, so the decision to cancel the show, yes, um, that was taken about twenty-four hours or so after this email was sent. Forty-eight hours. Forty-eight hours. Yes. Okay. Um, was that a reflection on the show? I think uh, a number of factors on that episode. Um, made it untenable for the show to continue. So it was a reflection uh, on the show. Was, the decision to cancel is a, is a reflection on the show. It was certainly a reflection on that episode, yes. But on the show, but, on, but, but I, I'd have to say, given that you're saying that you're not going to bring the format back no. um, and not going to have programmes with lie detector tests in anymore. Uh, I said in, it, we won't use it in that way, in, in that format. So, no, okay. we won't commission a show with that. Well, you have to say that's a reflection on the show, isn't it? In, you in, know, in totality. You know, not. for me, it's about we've taken a decisive uh, action. It, we've been very decisive about it. There were a number of factors involved, uh, which was specific to the episode. Um, it included actually some letters which have appeared mm. in the media, the, the report of which had uh, appeared in the media, the proximity obviously being very serious to the show. And we believe that was the right decision. Um, and, and that's what we've done. And we have done an internal review. And as I said, the, the processes have been followed. But we will learn from this and we will improve everything we do as a result of learning. But, but I think, given what you said, I think the decision to cancel the show yes. and not bring, not bring back that type of show again with Jeremy Carr presenting it um, could only be seen as a reflection on the character of the show. If it was just about one episode, then you could learn the lessons from what went wrong in that one episode or maybe look at the team make, producing the show and say maybe we need some, diff some different people uh, making this happen. But you wouldn't just cancel the whole thing unless you, your, your concern was there was a problem with the show and that problem wasn't going to go away. As I said, I, it was not about the show in general. We took a decision based on one episode of the show. That's what we looked at and that's why we cancelled the show. And it was a number of factors that gave us the... We believe it was the right d decision because we, we, we looked at what we had. Uh, things became clearer uh, over 48 hours. And there was, n there was no black and white there. I mean, it was a very difficult decision 
to cancel a show mid-production, um, but it, we believe it was the right decision. Do you, um, does ITV intend to work with Jeremy Carl on any future programmes? So Jeremy Carr does work for ITV mm. and has worked for ITV on other programmes and what we've said is that we will continue to work with Jeremy Carr but not in this format, not as a talk show uh, and we haven't confirmed what that would be. So not as a kind of conf well you should have not going to do a conflict Not a talk show, show not, a, not, not a short talk show of this ilk in any way. Okay, Clive Evans. I, I just really, what, 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 just to clarify because I'm, I'm in sort of disbelief that that this entire um, uh, 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 show was, was cancelled just because of, because of one episode. Um, so, I mean, for instance, let's go back to the issue of lie detectors. Was the efficacy of lie detectors ever discussed at, uh, at, at executive level? Did you ever really consider um, you know, whether it was appropriate to continue to use such a defective uh, testing system? So as part of our risk assessment of all our shows, we would obviously assess um, the, the shows on, on, on what was being used in the show. But I could say the lie detector set test specifically was not discussed at executive level. And I mean, were you aware of any concerns being raised about uh, lie detector tests? Was that ever brought to your attention, that they, you know, the impact that these tests were having on people and, you know, suspects, uh, suspicions about the... Uh, accuracy of them, um, well, the pu proven inaccuracy of them. Was that that was never ever raised with you? So no, that wasn't raised. I think the th the thing about lie detection tests, as I, as we've discussed, is everybody I think knew that they were not 100% accurate, and the range of accuracy is debatable. Um, so we knew, we all knew that, and we believed that we covered that because of the process before at screening and at, you know face to face conversations with participants. And indeed, at the front of the show, we make it very clear, and actually when the lie detector test is being used, we make it very clear that it's not 100% accurate. So we haven't actually had many participants complaining about that, the use of lie detector. We haven't had volumes of participants doing that, because if they did, actually, many of them would have written to Ofcom, and they didn't about the lie detector test. So, no, I think, you know, just worth bearing in mind, a lot of people on this show had issues I, I, some may have been vulnerable, but many of them had real life issues about relationships or problems with alcohol, whatever it might have been. And many of them wanted to do the lie detector test. And so what we had to make sure we did was go through our duty of care for that. So no, not volumes of complaints about that specific issue, which is why it wouldn't have come out up at executive level. So, 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 so you, you satisfied yourselves? Because, I mean, at the end of the day, the, you know, the, 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 the decision to go ahead with this show, um, when it was being made, is your decision. Um, and so you satisfied yourselves that, that, that um, even though these people wanted to take the lie detector test, that they were sufficiently warned about the inaccuracy of those lie detector tests that you were happy with the, to be continue to be used in those programmes? Well, I think as we've all said, that we do believe the production team, the medical staff, uh, Graham Stanier himself, all worked very hard to explain in what informed consent meant and explained what the lie detector test would entail and, its, and the fact that it wasn't accurate. I do believe the production team worked hard to do that. Thank you. Listen, Cole, you said earlier that um, the two companies that you use, the lie detector test companies, uh, had advertised that the accuracy of their tests was about 95%. I said in the 90s. In the 90s. When did you become aware of that? Because you've just said to my colleague that you never discussed um, the lie detector tests at your, at your level. So your Chris, uh, as director of clients, has I'm, been aware of that for some time. So when were you aware of it? I was aware of that a few weeks ago. A few weeks ago, yeah. right. And you were aware of it, Mr Wisson, from when? Uh, well, I mean, the show has been running for 14 years. The, um, the particular examiners that the show has used essentially is the same, the same team of examiners that have been used uh, for most of that time. Uh, and so I, I was aware, I can't tell you at what point I became aware, but I was aware that the examiners themselves would say that the show, that the, that the tests were accurate into the 90s uh, and those examiners I should say are qualified and trained they have American qualifications and certainly in, in the USA 
lie detectors, uh, lie detectors are more widely used than they are in yeah. the UK, it's fair to say. And so you've used the same company, you said, through the 14-year history of the programme. Um, were you aware at any point during that period of evidence from other companies and academics that, you know, that the, the accuracy of lie detector tests is not as good as 95 percent? Um, uh, no, I, I, uh, what I was aware of was that there is a debate, a genuine debate about the level of accuracy and obviously some people in the industry would say it's 95 and some might say it's less. Uh, the and did you ever as a risk mitigation issue think about going back and looking into that more or asking the companies that you use to verify I don't their claim that. of 95 I don't recall that ever being, ever being discussed. No. Right, okay. And earlier in your evidence you mentioned that the practitioners who administer the test um, to the member of the public, they did it in that hotel room in the Holiday Inn, I think yes. it was. Did they tell the um, contributors, the members of the public, as they're administering the test, that it was 95% accurate? No. No, they, they, they definitely didn't. You no. know for a fact that they didn't tell contestants that it was 95% accurate. No, I, I'm, sh I'm sure they did not. Um, but do I, you know that? Well, uh, I, obviously I, I was not I mean, present. I was, I was not present for every, every time, yeah. uh, the thousands of times that, yeah. that a live detector was administered. So no, I can't say that. So they've told you that I, they, they have told me, They have told accurate. me that they were always very clear with every guest that they made clear to the guests that it was not 100% accurate. Yeah. Uh, it's fair to say that they, uh, they would represent that it had a high level of accuracy, but that it was not, full, in other words, that it was not foolproof, that it was not 100%. But the producers of the show, if I, if I may just add to that, the producers were very clear that they didn't use the figure of in the 90s, as you saw from the previous panel, because mm -hmm. they would have mentioned it if they had. They used the figure, it is not 100% accurate, and that was what the show did. Yeah. And when those tests were actually carried out in that hotel room, was there a member of ITV staff present in the room when those tests took place? No. They were, they, they so you don't know what those people said to the contestants in those hotel rooms on any occasion, do you? Uh, they, the, the tests were recorded, so it would be possible to uh, ascertain exactly what was said. Okay. And the, reason, and the reason it was recorded was mm -hmm. actually primarily uh, so that if a guest later was to query the way that the test had been administered or, for example, to say that, well, that's not right, I wasn't asked that question, it would be possible to have a record to, to, to reassure them that actually okay. that was And did that ever happen? I don't recall it ever did, no. I, I'm, not, I'm not aware that it ever right. did. Okay, yes. thank you. Uh, and that, but that was recorded by the company themselves, if you like, for their, if you like, for their own protection. You like because they didn't want anyone to later say oh well it didn't it didn't go that way okay so I'm clear so um, you were aware of the 95% claim but you cannot say whether or not the practitioners who carry out the test made that claim to the members of the public who took the test in any of the tests that were carried out over that 14 year period I think I think the examiners would always have been very careful uh, to make it clear that it was not 100% But you don't accurate. know that, do you? You can't, you can't say that as a I, 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 I have not reviewed thousands of tests that were undertaken. Okay, thank you. So just one quick supplementary on that. On the, on the, what yeah, Joe I have others want to come on this to you, but just one. Just one, what Joe, Joe was just asking. So, so given that you, you, you had that information about them, was legal advice about how to uh, um, deal with the, the use of uh, a, a, a lie detector test? For instance, um, the terminology used on the uh, on the disclaimer that was on the screen um, was that ever discussed by the executives? I mean, because ultimately you're responsible, aren't you? Uh, I believe that was discussed by the production team. Um, it was, I mean, like everything else that goes into the show, it's a it's a, an editorial decision what we what we say on the screen. If I, if I might say, we need to make sure that we're talking about. The, the, the right processes in, a, in ITV. So the production executive would have definitely discussed uh, the use of various tools and techniques in the show. The management board or the PLC board would not have done that unless there was an alert. And there was not an alert for all the reasons we've mentioned. <coughs> the use of lie detection tests are within the broadcasting code. We have not broken any regulations uh, there were no complaints to Ofcom about lie detection tests um, and the participants, we believe we went through 
processes that ensured we had informed consent. So if any of those things were not in place, that's when it would have come up to the executive board. But the production executive would have discussed what was going on in the show. It's a daily show. Uh, it, goes out, it was going out every day, five days a week. Production said, would have definitely discussed it. Thank you, Brenda. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I think we can be honest here that, that for all the, the nuance and all the spin that you want to put on this and for all the references to the small print, in fact, the lie detector was presented as truth on the show, on the day, to the people involved and to the viewing public, it was presented as truth. And you had a presenter who was an active participant. He was a belligerent in this. And therefore, anything that you say now is trying to remodel what the facts of the case were. And, and as I say, you can hide behind the, the small print and the nuance of it, but that's the fact. Don't you agree? <coughs> Mr. Hara, I really, we would not spin anything. Uh, ever. Um, we're trying to be extremely open and transparent with you and as helpful as we can be. I think that we genuinely believe that we made it clear to participants and indeed on the TV screen, in the forms that were signed, that people understood that this test was not 100% accurate. We did what is required. We, did, we probably went beyond what is required to ensure that the participants of the show and indeed the viewers of the show knew that this was okay. not. For Jeremy Kyle, um, he had, he believed, I think, more in this, but he also knew they weren't 100% accurate. And you're right to say that on occasion he would say, this test says uh, you are lying. He would, he would use that, but that was his style. And everybody who watched the show and people who went on the show knew what his style was. It was very direct and it, 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 it would frequently do that. Now, you might not like that style, it makes people feel uncomfortable, no question. But we, we would not spin something like so this. You, so you honestly think that at all times, that both to your viewer, viewers and to your contributors, participants, that they were given absolute, you know, they, they knew and understood the absolute truth that this lie detector, the results of which were, as we saw in our clip, going to be thrust in their face and said, you're lying. I, they I, knew. I honestly think that the team did whatever they could to explain that. There will be some individuals that would not listen, I think, probably. That's just human nature. But I think the production team would have done everything they could to ensure people understood what they were getting into on that show. Partly because they had watched the show as a viewer, partly because they knew Jeremy Kyle's style. In fact, many of them wanted to be uh, on the Jeremy Cast show for that precise reason. So I think they will have done what they could to ensure that people understood that the lie detector test was not 100% accurate. So do you think then that the, 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 the show in itself, was it a public service, care oriented show, or was it a ratings driven, you know, sensationalist show, which was it? So I think you can have both in actual fact. I think this show had been going on for a long time. We are a commercial public service broadcaster. As you know, we do a huge range of programmes. Yeah, like that's sure. But this show, I would say, at its core, was trying very much to resolve people's issues. That's why they looked for people with issues, and therefore that was what the show was about. It did have some positive intentions. It didn't always work out like that. Uh, that is clear. So from day but one, it's driving force was conflict resolution and to bring people together, not to sensationally no. split people up no. or to lay people the, the most innermost feelings and fears in, in front of an audience of one so and a half million people. I didn't work at ITV 14 years ago, but when I have looked back on the purpose of the show, from its inception, it was a radio show first, became a, became a TV show. From its inception, it was about trying to resolve issues for people with normal lives in, 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 in the real world. That okay. is what it starts Can I just add one? Sure. Uh, Mr. O'Hara, um, I mean, you may not have taken evidence or been given evidence from me, but there are a large number of people over that period of time who did find that show helpful, who did find that it re resolved their conflicts or helped them with personal problems like addiction. That is on the record. There are a large number of people who did get 
benefit, benefit from it. Okay, can I ask you all just one, one final question at the moment? Um, up until it was cancelled in May 2019, were you as an ITV board proud of the Jeremy Kyle show and did it reflect the values that you wanted ITV to reflect? Well, perhaps I could um, answer that. When I look at the number of people who viewed it and enjoyed it, when I look at the number of people who wanted to get on the show because they thought it had some value, and when I look at the number of people, as I've just mentioned, who got some benefit from it, it, it was something to be proud of, yes. Well, OK. I, look, I'm, I'm proud of what ITV does. I think ITV is a, you know, does a whole... I, I'm very proud of ITV. You are right to be so I, by I think, asking specifically I, 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 about... Do you know what I would, I would say is that, um, you know, it may not be to your taste, the Jeremy Carr show or anybody around this table, but it was watched by a million people a day. Uh, we did not make a commercial decision around this show, right? The decision to stop the show, had we didn't even discuss commercial uh, okay. uh, things. But, but I think that what the core, the purpose of the show yeah. had a good intention. Yeah, so you, you're, you're answering lots of questions yes. I didn't ask. Yes. So let me ask once more, did the Jeremy Kyle show, before it was cancelled, reflect the values of ITV? It reflected the values of wanting to help people, of wanting to have people on a show that were from the public, where they genuinely wanted to seek help, whether it was counselling, therapy, rehabilitation, family mediation, child mediation, it did all of those things and it, it did help a lot of people and I know it's not a popular thing to say here but uh, cancelling the show um, is, is not as straightforward. I mean I have emails every day, there's a 50,000 petition asking for the show to be coming back. We're not going to bring back the Jeremy Carr show but it does show that there are a lot of people out there, the emails say this show helped me with my issues because they brought them into the light. So I'm just reflecting a different perspective to you where other, other people saw value in this show. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Julia Elliott. Thank you. Um, I just want to follow up a few things um, that you said. Mr Wisson, you said uh, that um, these lie detector tests were recorded. Did the contestants who were going through that process know they were being recorded? Yes. Now, we've heard from the chair already that actually, you know, being under stress being recorded. These are people who aren't used to being recorded in any situation. It's not like us sitting around here where cameras are on us 24 hours a day if we're in this place. Um, surely that in itself will negate some of the results of a lie detector test. Uh, well, I don't claim to be an expert or a, or a polygraph examiner myself, but uh, the polygraph examiner um, would explain to them that they, it was natural to be nervous uh, and, that, and that that would not influence the outcome and that the test itself had, uh, if you like, test controls built into it to, to take account of that. And so what they would do would be to ask a series of, if you like, control questions before they got to the particular questions which had been agreed with the, with the guest. So I, 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 perhaps I'm not explaining well. Um, I, I, think, I think what they would be told was that there was no need to, there was no need to worry about nervousness because that ultimately... Uh, would be taken into account when the examiners assess the physiological reactions which they were recording. That sounds just unbelievable to me. It, it really doesn't sound, it doesn't stack up at all on any level that at all. But mm. Miss Ali, could I just say one other thing about the experience of being recorded? I, I, I think it's fair to say that in the era of the smartphone, actually everybody is used to being videoed. In some cases, virtually all the time, some people record their lives. So I think, I think the, the, just on that particular point you made about being recorded That's in video... That's not what your documentation says. It talks about people being nervous, being nervy, when they're going to be filmed, so your documentation... That's, that's, no, that's a, that's a reference to the whole programme, the experience of going on the programme. You were just talking about the experience of taking the lie detector test and being videoed, and I just wanted to add that point. Mm. OK, well, I don't agree with you, but there we are. Um, I also want to come back to something uh, you said, um, Colin, about um, the work that your team worked very hard to explain the lie detector test. Mm -hmm. Now, we've sat here with uh, your team for more than two hours, I think, I don't feel they've explained to us at all satisfactorily the merits of the lie detector test, the way it works, or even that they actually knew totally how it did work, or the parameters around it. You've come in quoting percentages, know, it seemed to know far more about it than they did, and yet you've also said that it's their job to know that, and they didn't. So 
I find the statement quite alarming when you said they did work hard to explain the lie detector test, because if they can't come in here where they knew they were going to be getting asked quite, you know, searching questions on the whole issue, because it's a very serious issue, yeah. and they certainly haven't satisfied me, um, I, I can't speak for my colleagues, but I would be very surprised if they have on the answers to those questions. I find it quite alarming as you, as the head of the organisation, can say that they work very hard to explain to contestants or participants or whatever you want to call people um, to, that, that, to explain the lie detector test. I'm sorry you feel that. I, I feel that they might have also been a little bit nervous coming in front of the, a select committee. Some, none, none of them have done that before. I think that... Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, the production team were loyal and dedicated to this show and would have really, really wanted to explain fully what participants were getting into. They're called guests. Uh, they are looked after. You heard what Graham Stanier's role was, which was also to explain, but in a different context, the consequences of a lie detector test if it didn't go their way. So I do believe on a day-to-day -day basis that the team took this seriously. They took the whole show seriously. So do you think we show. have the right people in here answering the questions about that? Well, I mean, Tom is the executive producer of the, sh of the show. He's been involved in the show for a very long time. He does run a lot of other shows as well. There is a producer on the show day to day uh, who is not Tom. Uh, and Graham Stanier is, and his team uh, of medical nurses are on the show all the time. So you have some of the right people to answer your questions, yes. So moving on to um, one of the other things I was particularly exercised, this issue of informed consent. Yes. And, and you've mentioned that. Um, and I just want to ask um, very, very simply, do you feel participants, guests, were in a position to give informed consent? I would ask every one of you that. Just straightforward. Y yes, I do. And I, I did hear the bit about literacy and literacy skills and, and, and so on. And I feel that... What I can say to that is that on that show, people would, they filled in forms with somebody and they also had verbal dialogue with, with, with somebody. Um, so not only Graham's team, but also uh, the production team. So if there were literacy issues, I think they would be picked up in the course of those conversations. So they would have been taken into account. So I, 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 I think that informed consent is an incredibly important part of what we do. It's, an inc it's a pillar in duty of care for participants, particularly with members of the public. So it is an incredibly important thing, and I do think that we had processes in place that did ensure that things were explained sufficiently so that people could take informed consent. You said you wanted to ask each of us. Yes, yeah, so so I want each of you answer, and then I want to come yeah. back so to... I, I would, um, I think reiterate what I said to the chair uh, a little earlier. The people who went on the show were people who applied and really wanted to appear on the show. In fact, most of the people who applied didn't go on the show, but a minority got onto it. They applied to the show because they knew what the show involved. They wanted to be on it. They'd seen it every day. They were fans of it, I assume, or thought that it could bring them benefits. So they started with a very high level of knowledge of not only the show, the way the show was produced, the way it was presented, the effect on the uh, people taking part. So that's part one. And part two for informed consent is what Carolyn just said, which is very, very careful explanation of different parts of the show, how they might go, how it might be for you if they go this way or go that way. And I believe that took place. Yeah, yes, if I can yeah, I concur. Um, I mean, informed consent, obviously, is a, a kind of cornerstone of television. It's important in every programme that anyone takes part in, not just in the Jeremy Carl show. So it is a pretty basic um, requirement uh, for all programmes. And informed consent, essentially, is about, uh, in this context, did the, did the guest understand the nature of the show? Did they understand what they were letting themselves in for? Did they understand what their role in the show was going to be? Did they understand the likely uh, questioning that they were going to un be given by, by the presenter? And I think, uh, fundamentally, the answer to that question is yes. I think, uh, and I'm sure that Tom said it on more than one occasion, um, the people who uh, applied to go on the show tended to be uh, the people who watched the show regularly. And therefore, I would say they they really did understand what they were what they were you know what they were um, getting into, and and also that they wanted they they if you like they wanted 
many of the things which uh, I, I can understand, absolutely understand, why um, you know, other people watching the show would say, you know, why, why on earth would you submit yourself to that? Yeah, I would say that they willingly submitted themselves to it and they, and, and, and they did know quite what they were doing. I totally accept that it has tended to be people who are fans of the show, which isn't me, no. <laughs> um, who would want to go on the show. I totally accept that point. But I am concerned again, Carolyn, that what you have explained there is very different than what Tom explained in the previous session, because I pushed him very hard on this issue about literacy and understanding, because there's a lot of legal documents you've mm -hmm. sent us, and thank you for doing that, that you really do need to know what you're signing. Mm -hmm. and. He said, if basically, if someone said, yes, they could read and write and didn't have dyslexia, there would be no further pursuance of that. No, I think if oh. it was dyslexia, it would have gone through to Graham. Yeah. But, but if, it was, if, if they had said yes on literacy, I, I, I am saying, and I think Tom would say, that it would have been picked up in the verbal conversations, of which That's there were many afterwards. That is not what he said. So I, I, I would, if you can compare what, you know, okay, the, the well, sort of transcript I, I, I'll, and I'll then come back that again. with what... Sure is actually the factual representation happy, very of what happy happened. To do that. Let me watch that. So I want to move on to something completely different. <laughs> um, I could say light relief, but I don't think it would be. Um, Love Island and body image is what I want to move mm -hmm. on to. So um, a Comrade survey um, recently revealed that um, more than half of 18 to 34 year olds feel that reality TV and social media have a negative effect on how they view their own body image. Do you think ITV studios have a responsibility to show different types of body image among contributors? And I'm particularly thinking of the Love Island types of shows. Okay, so I think on, we do a range of shows. Uh, mm -hmm. As you all know, we do I'm a Celebrity, Saturday Night Takeaway, um, Fremantle Do For Us, Britain's Got Talent, X Factor, Love Island, of course we produce. They are very different shows and they show the diversity of Britain completely. Uh, including body image. So all of those shows have people with all, all, a range of shapes and sizes. Um, Love Island, I think the most important thing on that is that the people on Love Island tend to be young, they tend to be healthy, they are healthy, so we do do a BMI test. They are all within the healthy range of BMI or above. And actually, if you look at the series now, that's ongoing, um, they're not all the same shape, neither the men nor the women. They are different, they are, there are variations of shapes. Although I absolutely take your point, which is um, they are all fit, healthy, young individuals because it is a dating show. It's not I'm a celebrity, which is a range of celebrities of all different shapes and sizes who go on that show. And uh, actually, you, you've seen autism on I'm a Celebrity with Anne Hegarty, that was warmly welcomed. Uh, you see Lost Voice guy, voice guy on Britain's Got Talent who has cerebral palsy. You know, people were extremely pleased to see that uh, on ITV. So I think it depends on the show. So on Love Island, um, I was going to say, oh, do people conform to a particular body type? But you're saying they don't. But what you were saying is they're young, fit and healthy. They're healthy. Uh, right. They are within and, the BMI range and, for healthy or above. Right. And casting directors of that show, are they given instructions about physical appearance no. when searching for contributors? They're not. Or, so what are the guidelines on who they're looking for? So there's a very, very rigorous application and casting process. Um, we get about 98 thousand applications for Love Island. Uh, they then take that down to about 90 to 100. As soon as they get a call back, at that stage, they go through medical questionnaires, psychological questionnaires, assessments, that then goes down to about 30 to 40 who get selected to appear on Love Island. It's a very rigorous process of, uh, of screening that goes on before they actually get on to Love Island. Um, it, 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 I think on Love Island, if I may just say, we, it's, it's, been, it's four years old now, uh, th th this iteration of Love Island. Um, we got Dr. Paul Litchfield, who's the chief medical, who was a former chief medical officer, to come in. I mean, I'd been there a few months and I felt it was important to get him in to actually review what we do on Love Island and to actually give us uh, some feedback on what he would do. Uh, to improve our processes and our application screenings, etc. 
Um, and he, he's been very help, helpful. He now helps oversee uh, the duty of care processes on Love Island. So uh, actually, we have changed some of the things that we do as a, as a, as a result of that. And, and actually, less people get through to the 90 callback as a result of that. Thank you. On Love Island, um, last year UK Anti-Doping wrote to you about their concerns. I'm sorry, I, could, I, I didn't hear you. Um, last year UK Anti-Doping wrote to you about their concerns about the promotion of unrealistic body images on behalf of the men on the show. Is that that's correct? Isn't it? I, I honestly, I do not. I did not receive that letter. I, I, the first I saw of that was in a newspaper. So I'm fr I replied to all my letters, and I did. I, I don't recall that letter, not, and I have checked. And you're not aware of it, whether you. Well, did I, you I know through the newspapers that they have okay. definitely made. Because they, they made yeah, a approach to you directly. But did, did, do you know whether you can't do doping of racist with anyone else at ITV? Uh, I, 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 I actually checked into that, and I don't think we have seen anything on uh, that. Chris, are you aware? In, in response to the obviously you can't believe they did. <laughs> I don't. Um, in response to that newspaper article, though, which assert that they did and didn't get a response, have you contacted UCAD to ask uh, if they'd like to come in and discuss it? We would certainly do that, and I, I have actually asked somebody to make contact with them, and I think they have had a conversation. Um, so I will come back to you on that, but um, one of the things I would stress on Love Island is that they all go through testing. Uh, they're tested for drugs, they're tested for steroids, they're tested for everything. Uh, so we don't have, we have no tolerance for the use of any type of drug. Any performance enhancing drug. Substance. Okay. But um, yeah, I think and it's... And we make that very clear to the consent, to yeah. anyone participating in the show. No, well, well I, I, I'm sure you can have actually contacted me during the session asking if I would raise it with you, which to me would suggest they're not particularly aware that they've been approached well, for a contact, otherwise well, they probably I, wouldn't have bothered. They'd be just I'd be surprised the meeting. if they haven't been contacted, but I will pick that up. Okay, well, I'm sure you can probably... You can still watch it, and they may give us a further update before we finish about that, but... Um, I would hope they do because obviously I think if they are a national body uh, sure. on anti-doping. And we'd be more than happy to talk to them. Yeah. For the last, there was a, an article analysing the members of Love Island selected for the previous series. Half of the people who were selected had actually been approached about going on the show. They hadn't applied, they were approached and recruited, mm -hmm. most of them working at model agencies. Mm -hmm. Do you know for the current show what that proportion would be of people that have been approached to, to go on the show rather than apply? So I think we make it very clear in our um, process that uh, the team, the production team, continuously look for people who would be right for Love Island in terms of being able to be in the villa, the personality that they're required to have. Um, and we, we, we say very clearly that they go to festivals, they go to model agencies, they go to a, a whole range of different places uh, to see whether people are interested in. But they would still go through the screening process that I've just I'm, described. I'm sure they would, but the reason yeah. I raise it, the reason I think it might be, it might be significant, is that you know, in this article that was in The Guardian, I think, looking back on the previous series, you've got also people talking about turning it down and saying they're all large on the books of the same London model agencies, they all know each other, they go into the villa mm -hmm. knowing each other, some mm -hmm. joke about whether they or their friend will get approached next year about it. Mm -hmm. And that would suggest that you're, the, the people making the show are, are they're going for a very certain type of person. They're fishing from a very small pond for the people they want to be on it. I don't think they just look in that pond. I think they keep it quite open. So there are some people that go on Love Island that have never achieved any hmm. type of contract or agent or anything like that. In fact, we're very careful uh, to advise them to get an agent as soon as they go on Love hmm. Island. We actually encourage that because we think that gives them much more information about what it will be like afterwards. So there are people that come from a very different pool to that uh, but, on Love Island. Do, do you see that some people might be concerned that actually what is presented on one level as a reality TV show right, with casting, you know, sort of like street casting members of the public yeah. to be on it, yeah. is in, in fact, it's a slightly augmented reality, isn't it, in a way? Because you've, you've got a sort of, you've got a, a really quite a narrow cast of people that are, that are on it and half the people that are on it are actually approached by... The, production company rather than well, just applying and going through auditions or whatever. I don't know the proportion that is directly approached and those that are not and we can come back to you on that because mm. we'll know that for this year. Um, what I would say is actually it's a very diverse group of people. So if you look at the, the show, there's a biochemist on there, I think she is, a bioscientist, there's a model, there's a, you know, there's a, you know, there's a whole, there's diversity in terms of background, there's diversity in terms of fame. Uh, they're, 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 it, is a, it is quite a diverse pool, yeah. in actual fact. Are you happy with the BAME diversity on the programme? 
I am. I think we over-index actually on, on that and we work very hard to make sure it is as representative as possible of Britain. Are you concerned about the report some people have that people from BAME backgrounds tend to be last picked, first excluded, seem to get a less, less than a fair ride on the show? Do you know, I, I, I don't see the evidence for that, genuinely, and if there was, we would take that very seriously. I mean, if you look at the current show and you look at Yuande and Danny and uh, Arabella, uh, Yuande and Danny had an enormous amount of their time uh, in the last two or three episodes as a result of what was going on with them. So I think, and actually one of the most popular couples at the moment are Michael and Amber, who are both from a Bain background. Can, can I just say, mm. Chair, on that? Um, I, I welcome your question. Mm. Uh, and I do actually think that in giving rise to a debate about mm. representation and relationship between people of different ethnicity is a really healthy thing. Mm. And I, I really welcome the debate around the programme. And I think it's a sort of debate that a broadcaster like ITV should give rise to. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Charles Watling. I uh, thank you. Yes, I shall wait for my call from the producers of Love Island. Sure. Um, You're very welcome. <laughs> uh, you don't want me, really. Um, uh, it, just a couple of questions popped up uh, during the uh, recent uh, evidence you were giving. I mean, the, you, you said that the uh, Jeremy Carl's Carrick show came from uh, a radio show and then became the talk show and so forth. It seems like it's, it's sort of a natural progression from the world of Marjorie Pro Proops onwards, the agony aunts and moving on. So... It, and it became this combative series. Has it sort of grown and grown and, and outstripped you, the producers, in a sense, in as much as it's gone to places that you weren't expecting it to go? I, you know, I, I can't really answer that. What I would say is I think the format has remained very true to the original format. I think that it has always been this kind of show. I think the style of the show is a tabloid-style direct show, mm -hmm. and Jeremy's... Kyle's style has not really changed over the years. He is opinionated, he's hard-hitting, he's straight-talking. That's what he does. So I don't actually think it's changed into something else. I do think, however, that society has evolved quite a lot, and I think that mental health issues are, you know, everyone is far, far more aware and sensitive about that than they would have been 14 years ago, to be truthful. And I think that's why all shows have to evolve with the time. Right. Would you would you think it'd be fair to say that um, that that uh, the people's desire for their fifteen minutes of fame might overcome any reservations they might ha might have about privacy and exposure to ridicule? Do you think that might be a fair thing to say? Uh, look, I, I think people came on that show for a variety of reasons, and some of it was nothing to do with fame. In actual fact, I think many many people came on that show because they wanted to sort their own problems out. That is the evidence of the show, that people who asked repeatedly to be on the show were people who had some serious issues. And we've had alcoholics on the show who've been into rehab, we've had drug addicts on the show who have had help as a result of the show, and numerous relationship issues where they're trying to prove one to the other that they but can resolve 99 this. 99%, we were told in the last panel, uh, actually apply, having seen the show. Um, so therefore, they are after some sort of exposure, uh, and, and and I wonder because often we're dealing with very vulnerable people here. I wonder if they're fully aware of the um, uh, uh, of, of the repercussions of this potential exposure to ridicule. I, I would say that as the show has progressed, I think social media has probably intensified this. I think at the beginning of the show and for many many years, this would not have been as much of an issue at all. I think that in the recent past, uh, certainly the clips you might see on YouTube or the user-generated content around the show, the kind of echo chamber of social media, yeah. that can make it very different uh, for a participant on that show and who was actually perhaps coming on the show to resolve a problem. So our, uh, our, our it could give them other problems. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, so absolutely. Our, our participant, participants told about that because it, we are. know from other inquiries that we've held they that, uh, that there is bullying that goes on on social media platforms such as uh, Twitter and so forth, and suddenly you get a group of people, uh, suddenly it's like a pack of hounds hunting down, down the fox. Um, are they told of this possibility? Are they informed? They, they are, and, and they are on all our shows, especially uh, in the last few years. We have been, Social media is an important part of what we discuss with participants on Love Island, we actually give them social media training so that they are equipped to deal with really? what may come. Yes, because no one knows what 
no one knows how that's going to go. So they need to be equipped, they need to be trained. Because some of them will be famous, some of them won't be famous, some of them will be ignored. That can be as bad as being famous. So actually the most important thing is to equip them with the knowledge and the training to deal with social media and to get an agent, because an agent can be very protective of the so, individual so they're representing, you, you, as you, you know. You are fulfilling the care of duty as far as the best. It's important. I think social media has become a, a very important part of uh, informing people as to the implications of being on a show. Thank you. Um, so, Peter, just to turn to you, I mean, you're sort of the father of British reality television uh, with an amazing... Is that, is that an official record. position? Well, I, I've, I just, I've just bestowed it upon you. Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, I remember that the, the, I think, was Big Brother one of yours? I, th I think it, it's, it's a format I imported into the country. You imported into the country. Well, I, and I remember the first series and fascinating it was too, and I sat down and watched it as a social experiment. And s since then, it, it then reinvented itself and reinvented itself, always pushing the boundaries, always expanding, always moving on. And, and it seems to me that, um, you know, the, the way we're going is with as far as reality television is concerned, is, is, is we're moving inexorably towards a sort of a version of the Hunger Games. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, it, we're entering dangerous territory. But have we reached a watershed as far as re reality TV is concerned now? We thought we had when the Noel Edmonds show was suddenly shelved. You might remember some many years ago now when there was an unfortunate incident on that show and things changed. Have we reached another watershed now with the axing of the Jeremy Kyle show? Well, so I wasn't re responsible for Big Brother after 2007. Um, uh, actually, I would regard Love Island as a much more benign version of Big Brother uh, because um, it really has, it's all about relationships and romance and it's a much more benign version. So I don't think it's, it's a more extreme version of the earlier reality shows. If anything, it's a more benign one. Um, of course, this word reality is a difficult one to define, you know, because some people uh, apply the word to quiz shows, some people apply the word to fixed camera shows, some yeah. people apply the word to um, talent shows, even cookery shows, or The Apprentice is like a business skills program. Uh, 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 so it's not an easy one to tie down. Um, as regards Jeremy Kyle, it's a very, very different show to those other ones I've just mentioned. Yeah. It's a relationship show. It's takes place in a studio, people go and visit and they're there for a short period of time, they're not there for seven or eight weeks. So um, Carolyn's decision to end the show uh, means it won't be coming back. Uh, there is, I don't think there's a similar show like it on television. Uh, I wouldn't call it a watershed because I think other reality shows will go on and are hugely enjoyed. So you feel that the producers in future may learn a lesson from this because this is the... Well, one of the undertakings Carolyn's made to you today is it whatever learnings there are, and that includes your own conclusions, which we will read very carefully. We welcome your inquiry. We expect as a public service broadcaster to be held to the highest standards, so we're pleased you're holding this inquiry. We'll look forward to your, your findings. Uh, we will learn from it, and Carolyn has undertaken in front of you today to apply any lessons from it, if they're appropriate, to other shows, because she has undertaken publicly and to you and to the ITV board to continually improve our duty of care and her appointment of uh, Paul Litchfield that she mentioned earlier last year is an example of that. Uh, I could give you others but that is what she is about. Actually most importantly I think this is important for the industry, for the whole broadcast industry uh, and we have reached out already to PAT, who are the Independent Producers uh, Association, so that we can work on best practice for all the industry on all our shows that involve the public. Thank you. I just to for the record, obviously, the, our inquiry is looking at reality TV as a genre. We will be questioning other television companies and production yeah. companies in just the same way we have done with you today. Yes. Yeah. But we'll look at your conclusions very carefully, and we'll learn, I, I've no doubt we'll learn from them, and we'll uh, attempt to apply them. Mm -hmm. I just wanted a couple of uh, last questions to, to Mr. Wilson, if I may. Um, uh, it's about the, the contract. When um, contestants, sign a, contestants sign a contract, uh, now, I'm used to that, it's what I've done all my life, uh, and I'm used to seeing equity standard contracts, etc., etc., etc. A lot of people don't know about this, they, 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 and in, in fact, the general public, I would imagine, don't often sign contracts. Where do they do this? Do they do that uh, uh, at home? Do they, sign, do they get sent the contract at home, or, or is it in a casting audition that the, the contract is booked before? Oh, are you talking about Love Island? I'm talking about Love Island. Yes. yes. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I don't, I don't know at exactly what point they sign the, uh, the contract. Um, 
Uh, obviously, it's before they, they take part in the show. Now, are, they, are they guided through the process, then? Yes, I think they are. I think they are quite carefully guided through the process. And I think, again, it goes to, it goes to this point about informed consent. I think inform, informed consent is not just signing on the dotted line. It's very much having the nature of the show explained to you, and indeed, in, increasingly now, and in, in particular for Love Island, having explained to you not only what you can expect on the show and what will be expected of you on the show, but also what you can expect afterwards. In other words, the downsides as well as the potential upsides of suddenly becoming more famous than you, than you were before. And, and you're, so, you're satisfied that these 27 pages or so of legalese is, is adequately explained can, and clarified. Can, can I just build on, on that? The 98,000 will have an application form but once they've been, however they've come to, to, to Love Island, to, to, to wanting to be on the show, the 90 to 100 that get a call back will definitely be talked through the forms, will definitely be one-to-one, -one, will understand the implications of appearing on Love Island, will understand why, you know, they will go through with them, what happens if you leave the villa early, what happens if you are not selected, how will you feel, what are the wor what's the worst you will feel? Don't forget too, on Love Island, the families are involved, so we actually involve parents of participants if they want that, but we reach out to a much broader group on Love and Island, so it's a very comprehensive. You're confident that their processes, uh, your processes, ensure that they understand? Yes, I, am, I, I do feel confident about our, our Love Island's process. Right. There's something I, t I touched on earlier. Um, uh, the contestants are asked to sign away the possibility of getting an injunction uh, to prevent ITV showing any uh, footage you choose. Um, would you agree that that results in a si significant imbalance of power, shifting towards ITV and away from the contestant? I think we do that. Um, I mean, Chris is a lawyer by background. I think we do that because it's a standard clause that we put into every single contract. Because if someone turned around and said, I don't want you to film that, I don't want you to film that, I don't, they would be editing the show. Mm -hmm. So that is why we need to have the freedom as editors to make the show. It is um, something I touched on in the earlier panel, yeah, you yes. might have uh, noticed when I was talking about editing, and, and the power of editing. They understand what you can do to... Yes. Well, I, actually, yes. they are a generation who edit video themselves. Their me level of media literacy is wholly oh, different to the people so who took part in the early years of Big Brother. Just on that point, informed consent, which is a an issue you quite properly have raised as a committee with us and our colleagues. Um, but, you know, informed is one important word, consent is the other important word. And we need to get genuine consent from them. So if everybody who took part in the show got together afterwards and wanted, legally or otherwise, to stop various parts of the show being shown, it wouldn't be practical. So that's the reason for that clause. It's a practical reason for that clause. But it's only fair and meaningful if they have informed consent, and we do believe they do have informed In consent. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I think that's, that's great. great. Thank you. Joe Stevens. Thank you, sir. Um, can I just pick up on what we've just been discussing? Mm -hmm. So the contract, thank you for sending it to us, you know, is, is very substantial, much greater than an actor's contract, I'm told by Giles. Um, at any point, uh, for the people who have to sign this contract, do you advise them to get impartial legal advice on the terms of the contract? I'll be honest, I don't know, but I believe that we do. But I will. You don't know. I can check with them. With the, I can check with the, uh, the so producers. I'm pretty sure, given that we advise that they get an agent, we would say to them, get some, an agent early. Some, 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 uh, a, a, a minority, but some, I think, actually have an agent before they before they sign so, up to do the show. So we you can't say that they get impartial legal advice on this contract because actually this contract um, requires them to hand over all of their rights in perpetuity for a huge range of things, copyright, performers rights, royalties, their name, photographs, representations um, and the contract covers a period beyond the actual filming of the programme um, and if they wanted to get out of the contract at any point, they have to pay a release fee to ITV and that is decided upon by ITV. So, um, so you know, people are signing themselves up to very, very restrictive terms in this contract. So I'm quite surprised that it's not a requirement or that you're very clear that you do advise people to get impartial 
legal advice on it? I'd be surprised if they didn't. I mean, I think advising them to have an agent is partly because well, the agent would look at the contract. If you could check, so we will, we will verify yeah, that yeah. and come back okay. to you. And there's a couple of things I just wanted to ask you about in the contract, and maybe Mr. Wisson is the best person to ask, but I'll leave it to the three of you to decide. Um, you've been very clear in your evidence and your colleagues previously about the what you consider to be the proper professional medical provision on the programme. So I'll leave Jeremy Kyle aside for the moment, but on mm. Love Island, you mentioned the chief medical officer, I think, mm. that you'd have review all the procedures. Um, and in the contract, uh, it actually says here that um, you know we will give you during the lockdown period such medical assistance as you need um, as, as your, and the medical providers that you have there uh, determine as necessary in their absolute discretion so you have medical people Stop. qualified yes. to make a decision in their complete discretion about treatment um, or any medical assistance but then further in the contract it says that um, you will not be liable for any damage or loss arising from medical treatment or misdiagnosis provided by our medical team during the programme. So if I'm a contestant on Love Island and one of your medical people wrongly diagnoses me with a sexually transmitted disease, for example, and I get kicked off the programme as a result with all the public humiliation that that involves, you don't accept any liability. Why is that clause in that contract? Uh, can I say something about that? I think that would be a standard clause in any contract about liability on medical... Not in contracts so that I've I, written. I, but I, 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 sign, I sign forms for my children at school, which absolves the school of medical treatment for a child, because well, they, they won't be liable for whatever treatment they give a child. So I, I think that is a standard contract. But you are standard telling contract. people that you provide medical yes. assistance, yes. but then you don't accept any liability for the medical assistance or diagnosis that you provide. I honestly think that is a pretty that is a standard contract when you're filming on location. So I, 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 there, there's no medical practi practitioner that we would get on that show that would not have that clause in there because it so is. So do the medical practitioners on your show have um, professional indemnity insurance? So if they do something wrong, that the insurers will pay out. I should think so. So why do they have the medical indemnity think, insurance well, think, if you don't but accept but any liability? But I think that's what but many doctors do that. I mean, or, gen, genuinely, doc, doctors do that. Yeah, I'm really... I, that, that's, I've so, spent 30 and, years and, looking at and contracts. Can, can I just, so so, so really we do have that. medical practitioners on the show, but we also have a psychologist, Sandra Scott. She also has two psychologists on the show, two psychotherapists on the show, and other staff. So it's, it's a, it's, it's a, there's, there's a lot of resource on the show. Okay. So I want to move on to something completely different now, which is about the legal status of the contributors. So um, having looked at all the documents that you provided, um, I've seen the expenses that are paid to contributors, and I've seen the period of time during which this contract applies and when they have to devote their entire time, every minute of every day, to, um, to the work. If you applied the national minimum wage to this work, and I appreciate that you don't accept that they're employees, it looks like Love Island contestants would earn about £2.80 an hour for doing what they do. Do you, do you think that's appropriate? Have you included the, uh, the, the care of the whole team in your, in your costings there? Have you included I'm talking the... about what they are given as a consideration, which is the payment so, for so we should entering bear in mind into this contract. Of, whenever the public appears on any show, mm. um, they're not paid to appear on the show. No, but they're given um, expenses. And they are given, right? well, yeah. they're given expenses. Yeah. And that is made very, very clear mm -hmm. to every participant on the show. Yeah. They go in there knowing absolutely that we will pay their expenses mm -hmm. and they will get a lot of... But those uh, expenses aren't reimbursement for outlay, are they? No, no, it's, a, it's a subsistence, so effectively, yeah, on some of so, money. Yeah, yeah. So members of the public mm -hmm. are not paid to appear on... Programs. Yes, no, I heard you say that. So, so, so that's what I'm saying. So, yeah. th so trying to but, to divide the expenses up on No, no, but that what I'm saying is, is it's the equivalent of, of about £2.80 an but, hour. But, so, but we um, don't accept that because they're not, they come on willingly and are not expecting to be paid for their appearance okay. on the show. They are expecting their expenses to be paid. And by giving up all of the things that you require to them, them to give up in, in signing this 27-page uh, contract, um, 
there's a, there is, as Giles says, I think a very big power imbalance between ITV and the person who's coming on the programme. So in France, there's, um, there's been a recent court case where participants in a very similar show to Love Island were given the status of employees. Um, why don't you do the same? Because that's French law. So we operate in France, um, and I've experienced in France, and French law says everybody is an employee. Mm -hmm. uh, I think actually the um, benefits of being on a show like Live Island and what we provide to those participants probably exceeds anything that uh, legislation would require. What, like, so... so Yes, it would exceed. Twenty-four it, it hours a day. Would exceed. The working time directive. Well, I we don't I, have the benefits. I said the, be the benefits of the show. So, um, we comply with all regulations, and mm -hmm. and we would say that that that's not the way it works here. And we yeah. would be happy to discuss further the French way. I don't know in detail mm -hmm. uh, what, what that will will mean. Mm -hmm. uh, we're very happy to discuss that yeah. going but forward. As a point but of, just as a point of. Um, principle or, or as an idea, you know, would you have an objection to people who go on to the show being employees for the period of time well, that they're on the show? I, think I know I, you don't have to do it, but I'm just asking... You could, know. I, could I help? I of course. Um, yes. I think Karen said she'd be happy, happy to look at that. Mm -hmm. I think the truth is these people are very, very well looked after, not only while they're on the show, but after they leave the show. And the reason it's suggested to them that they get agents is because being on the show offers them the opportunity of actually earning very well after the show, and some of them do earn very well. So if you take it in the round, I think it's quite beneficial to them. Right. OK. Um, actually, I'll leave it there. I don't okay. have any more questions. So if you're going to come back to us for a discussion on, on the employee status later, that's fine. Thank you. Brendan Thank you. Thank you. Um, you, you, may, you may have heard or, or, or have seen the exchange I had with Mr. Steny and Mr. McLennan around uh, professional qualifications of the people that you, you employ. And I think you would agree that if ITV and, and others are going to make these contributor-based reality shows in which, the, as we said, you know, the, the innermost failings and faults are going to be laid bare and they could end up being dreadfully hurt by the experience that suitably qualified persons have to be in place and on hand to be able to provide help and support. So given that, why is the minimum qualification required by ITV to act in that lead contributor care role not including having to be registered with the Health and Care Professional Council? Are you now referring back to the Jeremy Carr show? Yes. Yeah. But, but I think generally, I mean, no, so I mean, I'm not looking for the minimum threshold that, yeah. that you would employ So I think somewhere. it does depend on the show um, in terms of the duty of care. So duty of care is an overriding principle of all shows where the public appear. I think it depends on the show what, what you would do in terms of result, what, what you would put on that show. So I've just explained to Ms. Stevens what the... Uh, the, 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 what resources we put for aftercare and indeed during filming and pre-screening pre, pre on Love Island, which is psychologists, psychotherapists, um, a, C a former CMO. Um, that, 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 and that's because it's eight weeks of filming. Uh, some people could be on it for the whole eight weeks. Some people will be on it for one week. But that's, you know, that's a different kind of show to being on the Jeremy Carl show for maybe five minutes, six minutes. But now, we, we, we on, on the Jeremy Carl show, as we, I think they explained, Graham Stania has a range of qualifications, including understanding psychology, but he's a psychotherapist. He also used three registered medical health nurses who had extensive experience in the NHS, and that was seen as appropriate for the Jeremy Carl show. So you don't have a minimum standard for all of these shows? No, it's, because they're so different. So it's... it's each show is it, taken it, in individually. Yes, yes indeed. So, okay. and so, but, so but, when so Dr. referring to, to Jeremy Kyle's show, are you, even with hindsight, are you yeah. comfortable that there was no one who was suitably qualified in psychology on that show? So when Dr. Paul Litchfield came in to review all of our processes on Love Island, we also asked him to look at our other shows. And ironically, he was actually on the Jeremy Carr show the day we suspended the show and then cancelled it. So he was going to do a review 
of the processes on the Jeremy Carr show, and I, I, I don't know what his advice on that would have been because it didn't get completed because we cancelled the show. Well, do you think, given the circumstances, that it might be a useful lesson for ITV to actually get that person that you, you mentioned to, to complete that review just to see if your processes were sufficiently robust and perhaps yeah. should there be no. a, a blanket I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. I mean, we, we're, we're working with him. He's an independent uh, practitioner and he is uh, both a psychologist. Well, he's, he's, he's very well qualified, I think, to do that and uh, we will be working with him on a range of different shows. And will that be including looking back on what happened over the 14 years of Jeremy Kyle, just to see if the processes that you had in place were sufficiently robust? I, I think because of the changes on that show already, I'm, I'm very happy that he looks at the Jeremy Kyle show and the current processes uh, on that show and what we could have improved. I'm very happy that he does that. Okay, so that so would make sense. You know. yeah, so, so, so there will be a retrospective look I, at what yeah, was done. Sure. I mean, could I add, I, I think it's fair to say the, the industry as a whole is now going to have a, a you know, mm -hmm. conversation and of course we're going to have, shortly going to have a consultation with Ofcom and I think one of the aspects of that conversation will certainly be what are the appropriate qualifications for the, uh, if you like, the psychological experts that programmes uh, use, what expertise should they, should they employ for a whole range of different types of programmes and there is there's a genuine, uh, I think, again, there's a, you know, there are genuine differences of opinion about as to what are the what are the correct uh, attributes or qualifications, uh, and across the industry, you know, there are, I mean, you know, there are a range of disciplines. So there are psychotherapists, there are psychologists, there may there are psychiatrists. You know, there's a there's a there's a, there's a range of different um, uh, qualifications uh, among the experts who currently. Um, advise different programmes. So, without wanting to put words in your mouth, but would it be fair to say then that ITV would be looking at a root and branch review of the role of this psychologist, this uh, yeah. psychotherapist, yeah. you know, call it what you will, but I think that, it, that professional yeah. qualification. I think, it, as, as someone shows. said quite recently, that, 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 that the public are quite confused about the different roles, never mind people who actually work in the industry. So I think we would welcome looking at what we do on all of our shows, and I think the industry would welcome that, so that actually we are clear as to when a certain profession would be very helpful on that particular format. So I think we'd welcome that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Um, I think that concludes our questions this afternoon. Thank you very much for your evidence. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you. The proceeding has ended.